It is 7 o'clock. I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the 15th of July, 2024. And uh, first, I'd just like to start by thanking uh, the town, all the volunteers, for what I think is an exceptional effort uh, in flood recovery. Um, the word that I kept on hearing was, we're getting good at this, which maybe both good and bad at the same time, but uh, it is what it is, so you know, I think we should be proud of that and thankful for every, everyone that's been working so hard uh, towards this recovery effort. So thank, uh, let's move to the first item on the agenda, which is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I think you meant uh, that no, to be No, we, we, we weren't familiar with the owl. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was uh, an approval. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The uh, agenda is approved as written. Next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So agenda is approved as written. Next is the public session. Uh, anyone wishing to address anything not on the warned agenda? Uh, Ask to please come forward and give your remarks to three minutes if possible. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm fully aware of the circumstances that this town is under once again with the flood issue. Um, and because of that, um, the resources from the pit are being accessed frequently. Um, I actually was asked to haul material. I try to prevent from hauling too much material myself because I don't have time for it. I can get other trucks to do that because there's, but because there's such a shortage of trucks, uh, I had to actually get behind the wheel again today. Uh, I had spoke with Tom there a while back about um, some of the brush problems, the tree problems, overhanging limbs and stuff in the road. Um, mm -hmm. Just traveling from the pit today to Maggie's Way, I can't tell you how many vehicles, there's only one, really one lane when you're driving a big truck, there's only one lane and that's the middle of the road uh, because the limbs are growing in so bad. Uh, as I was coming up over the hill to Maggie's Way down onto Guild Hill, there was a pickup truck coming my way. He stopped dead in the road at the bottom of the hill to wait till I came down to where he was before we both could fit in the road. Um, and I, the only reason I'm expressing my concern about it is because it's becoming a, a serious danger. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage any of the board members, uh, if you'd like to ride with me, I'll be hauling material tomorrow. You can just take a ride one trip. Uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know. There's probably not excess money in the budget right now. Uh, whether or not we could do something to address that. Mm -hmm. I know we, the workload is horrendous right now because of the flood, and, and I completely understand, but I have been talking about this for some time now, uh, but recognizing just how bad it was today uh, made me come forward. So, thanks. Yeah. thanks, Chris. I know that you have talked this over with Tom, and uh, we'll uh, try to address it. Can't guarantee you we're going to be addressing I mean, it this way. And I'm not saying it out of sour kickism. Any one of you could jump the truck with me and you might see for yourself what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think, I think we're at least somewhat familiar, thanks to you, uh, of the issue. Anyone else? Uh, Heather Slayton. Heather Slayton. You're recognized. Heather? Hi. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't read the agenda. I didn't have time, so I'm not sure if this is on there, but I am here from Washington County Mental Health Services. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make everybody aware, I've gotten some flyers out and connected with some folks from Waterbury, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that our SOS Vermont blood counseling service is still available. It is completely free. You can get three to five sessions with us. No record is kept. Um, and we just really want to make sure that everybody is aware that we're here and we are happy to come out and meet with anybody. You don't have to become a client. If any of you all or anybody watching knows of somebody with a distinct need, please reach out to us at our main line. It's no different than any other day, 229-0591. We're happy to hold groups, forums, one-on-one. -on -one. We can come right to people's homes. I've done that since last week. I've been out to several homes already for people who have called, mm -hmm. but we really just want to make sure that people know that we're here and we are happy to travel. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, what is that uh, number again? 802-229? It's right here. 0591. 0591. All right, thank you very much. 0591. Yep, got it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay. We'll move on to uh, the next item, which is flood recovery response. I'll start with Tom. Um, I think from the from the town's infrastructure side of things, um, Blushaw Road was a, the, one of the dangling participles, and that's now the back side of it, and that's open now. Um, still a lot of minor work. Um, Woody has gotten quotes on some of the bigger projects, um, and he can he can come on up and, and join us. Um, I had talked briefly last week about Stowe Street um, and how there was a challenge, how the, some of the banks swapped off as, as the brook took water aside. So mm -hmm. got a quote for that. I think you said Stowe Street was in the range of $40,000 to fix. Um, the, the Greg Hill fix is the, is the bigger one. Um, looks like that's something like 150 dollars um, as part of it. Um, um, Stowe Street, 30, 35 to 40, I wrote down. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Laurel Road Bridge, the, the fill that was lost around the bridge, um, around the, <coughs> in the range of 80. Don't have a number yet yeah. for um, Shaw Mansion, but I just don't think it's reasonable to consider discontinuing that road. Um, and it's like we're about to have that conversation. I would just suggest a future agenda item. Yeah. Uh, Mike, while you're talking about Shaw Mansion, I was kind of just down there. I would really recommend to Woody because I know that I could see by there's some tracks and stuff. People, some people have ignored the road closure sign, and I don't know if we could just, you know, right by where the ditch is, put like some sort of a barrier across. You know, if someone's really determined, they're just going to move the barrier, but. It's gonna, for the casual person, it's gonna say, because I'm really worried that That's some of those down. banks are gonna potentially fall in. Yeah. And if you have someone driving through, do we could be a serious injury. Do so, we have Jersey okay. barriers on hand for that? I don't know offhand about Jersey barriers. There's certainly you know, material we could put there. <clears throat> we can put some barriers there. Yeah. Um, Jersey barriers are, would require machinery to get there. Sure. Yeah, I'm even talking maybe even just more simply though, you know, like the <laughs> cross, wooden crosswalk kind of things. Yep. That would just, you know, be an impediment for people, the casual people who are not going to may not say, hey, maybe I really shouldn't be driving through here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we could do something like that. So in our, in our minds, when we sum it up and add up all the smaller patches where shoulders are done, um, you know, probably safe to round up to $300,000 or a little more. Is that total just for the patches? That's for the patches. Um, you know, Graco Road is the, is the big one. The challenge there is, um, you know, if the culvert was eight feet and that wasn't sufficient, it's logical to upsize everything at that point. You may be doing this, you know, concrete structure. Mm -hmm. So it's a bigger, more expensive project. 
So we should assume Greg Hill is going to be closed for a while. Right. But people can uh, access it via the, the northern route. Yeah. Um, all that has been reported to FEMA, or what's the status of that? Um, all, that's, all that's in the pipe to be reported to make sure we get the declaration on it, yeah. yeah I think I'm with District 6, the state representative who documents costs that will go to FEMA to see what whether we've hit the threshold to qualify. Mm -hmm. So he traveled with me today and we marked each site. And they estimate damages through an app they have um, that may or may, may not be super accurate. But, uh -huh. it's, but it's, it's, it totals it's, up on that. Yeah, yeah. So and his thought was we we will we're, we're going to be we'll the threshold. threshold. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Did he have a figure at the end of the day? No, other than he knew. Because it's, I believe it's countywide, or yeah, yeah it's it was going to be a no doubter. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. we got there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here today that the number for playing field is fifteen million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. So, so. And then I had reported last week when we had the emergency meeting, we were concerned about the Wesley Church and Rec being able to use that for the summer. Um, not as much water as we thought. It's dried out. They were in it today. So, that's great. What a Good. relief. One more thing. Um, yeah, Mark. I was at a meeting on Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, and Mike Hedges brought, I, I haven't had a chance to go up there, by Henry Huff Road. Mm -hmm. I guess there was some, you know, pretty significant damage. Yep. You, you've been yep. up there. Henry Huff Road is in Mike's yard. Yes. Yes, yeah. I know. Uh, that's <laughs> why he's concerned. <laughs> so, is he um, going to return it to us? Yes. So, the Henry Huff was, has been restored partially today with the help of okay. South Burlington, has provided equipment for us to use as well. Um, and that's an ongoing project. Yeah. I say I would bring it up. So, I, that's great that you did that. He's probably pretty happy. Yeah, yeah. He will be happier when all that's off his horse pasture and all yep. that other stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Woody. Yeah. Woody, what other priorities are you working on? Um, well, I think my direction, um, I would like to be directed by the board or Tom or whoever as to, we expect this will be FEMA. How would you like to proceed with like the Laurel Road Bridge and some of these others that perhaps contractor availability may change here? You know, um, mm -hmm. trucking's a big issue right now. Um, while we've had a team of engineers look at the Laurel Road Bridge, it's structurally sound. Um, the sloughing off of the roadway puts the water line in danger a little bit, as well as access to the bridge. Uh, as well as if we get more heavy rains, I don't can't say what would happen on Stowe Street with that slide as well. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the big ones, like Tom mentioned. Greg Hill, while a big ticket item, isn't really. It's not going to get worse. You know. And that's safe can be said for the dip and others. So. Do you think that you or uh, the town has capacity to actually do that work on uh, both the uh, Shaw Mansion and Greg Hill? Um, not, we'd have to rent a, mach a larger machine for both projects mm -hmm. if needed. Um, I spoke with a reputable local contractor this morning about a price for the dip in there. Yeah. Um, while there is a need for a large volume of material there, not necessarily a lot of good material needs to go there. I mean, structural type of material, you know. I mean, we're talking it's 12 feet deep in spots and, and what have you. Um, and the culvert in the dip is fine. I mean, really? nothing wrong with the culvert. Okay. Uh, whereas in, on Greg Hill, the culvert is in a horseshoe shape. So I think both those would be contracted out, and our crews would focus on the smaller road cuts to keep the ditches established and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, that, what's what makes sense to me, uh, and Tom, uh, you can tell me what, what direction you might ask for from us, but uh, I'm thinking like whatever impinges on public safety would probably be the top priority. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, you're, you're about Laurel Road and Stowe Street. You're, concern is getting it fixed quick. We don't know what the weather's going to bring. A little mm -hmm. rain the next couple days, nothing horrible. That looks like decent weather, but that's looking a week out. Uh, yeah. So I think if there's 
reputable contractors who can do it and do it quickly. I think we do it and do it quickly. FEMA did not press us hard at all on um, some of the more expensive items we had last flood. Mm -hmm. So I think they understand that they're emergency situations. You've got to get got to get things fixed quickly. And uh, it's all been documented the uh, extent of the damage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did anyone else on the board uh, feel like weighing in on this in terms of priorities? Um, okay. Sure. Uh, just like you said, public safety to me is the number one issue. If <clears throat> if Greg Hill can be accessed from the other side, and then you can still access Shaw Mansion from both sides with just the dip being blocked off. I don't think those are high priorities. Um, if we're not worried about the sides of those roads giving way in any other part of the road. Um, so, I mean, if we're looking at Stowe Street, might endure some substantial damage if we get another torrential downpour. I think we focus our efforts on the roads that or highest at risk. Others, Mike, Melissa? Just a thank you from my wife for the, <laughs> the, the repair on Guptill Road, that oh. trench there. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I also thought that would be a real hazard because at night someone could yeah. go yeah. right into that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was we also did have the team of engineers inspect all our bridges. Um, everything looks in decent shape right now. Yeah. So mm -hmm. That's much appreciated. And the repairs on the bridge that's under construction on Guptill is going forward? Yeah, they're going to go forward. Uh, they should switch traffic patterns next week. So we'll be on the other side of the bridge doing work. Um, essentially, nothing got washed out there. Okay. So we'll be ahead. Okay. Ian, anything to add? Um, no, I mean, I agree with the, the safety um, piece there that uh, Shaw Mansion and um, Greg Hill can wait if that's not a safety concern. And I agree if Stowe Street is becoming a safety concern or is thought to be a safety concern that, um, yeah, action should be headed that way. All right. Um, yes, Alyssa. Just technical question in terms of Tom, are we just spending fund balance? I would just acknowledge, like, I think Waterbury is fortunate to be in the position that we can make needed repairs and other neighboring communities with much more needs aren't necessarily having cash in the bank, but just what's the approach in terms of, I support the approach, what we're doing? We spend it um, now, um, and then we, we, at year end, if we don't have the money, we book an account receivable based on the estimated amount. So yeah, that's all, when the financials are presented for 2023, and there will be a big, you know, six-figure account receivable for expected FEMA re revenue. Okay, thank you. Great, okay. Uh, anything else from the town? I think we're proceeding pretty well. I think we want Liz to. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just going to turn the page to uh, crew. Okay. Well, um, thank you for putting up with the mess. Um, it is a mess that uh, I just want to publicly commend Arthur, who has been cleaning this mess every night, and it's incredible. I just, um, right? You come back in in the morning, and it's just better. So we have, um, we don't have a full picture of everyone. There's still people who are reluctant to report either to us or to 211. But what I think we could say is almost everyone who was affected last July was this affected, was also affected, plus um, 40 or so new homes in Waterbury. So for us, it is bigger to the extent of the damage may be less because Many basements were empty, for which we're very grateful. A lot of homeowners were able to move up their um, mechanicals in the basement last time, between now and then, and we're looking forward to helping them do that this time. Right now, the biggest things are, um, you know, moving as fast as we can through the cleanup process. And for a lot of homes, we, especially, you know, again, Bill, I gotta commend you and Tom for working so hard on getting the factors, getting things, you know, cleaned up. We'll be able to move to the mold um, prevention process, which we had really good success with last year. The humidity is incredible, right? It's gonna take a long time to get things dehumidified enough to do that. But um, people are moving and we'll be having a lot of concrobium, which is the um, stuff we use delivered. We have, um, you know, we're soliciting volunteers. We're 
absolutely looking for volunteers this week. We'll be doing the same shifts every day. Um, and then I'm also reaching out to the big companies and organizations to see if they can spare teams of people to come and move through you know, whole neighborhoods. Again, we do have some neighborhoods where this is new for them, so you know, they need support and step by step. The, um, I do want to ask, do you want, I have um, the two-on-one data, comes to the long-term recovery group every day. We can pull out kind of the culvert driveway, you know, groups of people if that would be useful, kind of for people to get a sense of where is all that damage. I think Woody, you probably know, but we can, you know, certainly see. I saw some something new today. It's like, oh, I didn't know they got hit. There is, but there's um, things are broadly like basements, culverts, and driveway, bigger problems. Right, and that is, um, you know, kind of where things are sugaring off. So we're in the, you know, 200, 250-ish range in Waterbury. Again, we'll have better numbers a week from now, right? We're, we're continuing to canvas, continuing to get our flyers out. Um, just Heather, uh, your flyer is on the back of ours. So the crisis counseling information gets to every house. Um, but, um, you know, crew has a larger service area, so just sur the surrounding towns of Waterbury, which were also very badly affected. And I think we're going to end up, you know, at this moment probably with um, 400 plus. We are collaborating with the Matt River Valley Rotary. We're talking to the other towns. Tom Lights has been encouraging other towns to get dumpsters and plan for the debris that's coming out of homes. And there's, you know, really serious road problems um, in every town around us. But again, the majority of that damage in a lot of the other towns is private roads, roads, culverts. It's just the houses that got hit there are hit much worse. So it's um, definitely a set of new challenges. But we have had over um, 300 volunteers since Thursday. Um, many of whom are people who come back day after day. And again, they're doing everything possible in these homes. The Rotary has been sourcing meals from local restaurants for flood affected families and volunteers. So really grateful for all that they have been doing. And as long as the um, select board lets us use the room and <laughs> as people need help, we'll be here. I mean, we'll, I don't know if it'll be quite as fast as December, but hopefully we'll be able to move everybody into a place where they are not concerned about mold. A lot of people are ready to talk about next steps. As I'm sure you know, Tom, you said you've been here from people. What other questions? Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's uh, the same number as a year ago, uh, July, plus another 40 houses. So that was 210 in July of uh, last year, the plus 40. Uh, properties, right, properties. so there's, right, so kind of in that we count the Wesley, we count the funeral home, right? So it like includes all, right. businesses, yeah. 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 and we'll have a full count. Um, again, just we, um, I wanna push the pitch for 211. I know it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there for people about what it means. Mm -hmm. The help that it means is helping the state make the case for the individual assistance um, part of FEMA be granted and then we get the information we review it we call you and say what help do you need um, I will say for folks you know who are dealing with driveway or private road those kinds of things until there is a private a, a, a individual assistance FEMA declaration there is not a lot of help <coughs> this is a real problem right in a state that has a lot of um, private roads that last year's declaration, private roads and driveways were considered for the first time in a FEMA declaration um, in New England. And um, so that is going to be a solution for people if we get the individual assistance declaration. If we don't, that is a real challenge for people. And um, I've had some conversations with folks who've dealt with this in other circumstances. There are not a lot of resources out there at this time 
for private roads, right? It's really, it, people are very concerned. And that is a lot of phone calls that are coming through our line saying, what do I do? How, how do I pay for my driveway? Do you know uh, offhand how many people uh, from Waterbury have reported to 211? Um, it is 125, but I will say that there are people who um, we would consider as living in Moortown who consider themselves as living in, in Waterbury, and the same would be true of Fulton. Right. So, um, but then we know, you know, it was true the last time that we had a lot more um, houses we were working on than the numbers in 211. And many people don't want to report, they don't see why, if we're already at their house helping them. Right. to reiterate the case, it does uh, does impact them uh, because of the potential of uh, getting more support. It helps the state, it, right, as a whole, make the case that we, we need more assistance. I It was the first question I asked um, of the folks in the um, Doug Farnham's office was, do our numbers count for anything? And the, you know, and the answer was no. It is only two on one. You have to, you have to call 211 or, now, or to register. It, it is not for an individual to get assistance. I want to be very clear. Right. You do not need to report to 211 to get assistance. If we get the declaration, the only numbers that will be counted for the declaration for individual property owners is what goes to 211. Right. So, I, I mean, you know, I was referencing Plainfield. If the people of Plainfield do not call 211, that we are all affected by that because they're in Washington County. Good point. Others? Tom, oh, just want to suggest, um, I, did, I did just have a hallway conversation with Dana Allen about this um, over the last couple of days, but um, Planning Commission was in here recently just talking about next steps and priorities, and I wonder now if there should be a further conversation now, should the PC be looking at things like stormwater regulations on new development, especially in Waterbury Center, given the challenges we've had with the roads there? Should we be looking harder about things like driveways? Um, I might want to look at that from a zoning enforcement perspective, too, but I wonder if we have the PC to focus on that a little bit in the short term and maybe not leave that for phase two. Well, isn't the plan for them to move directly to uh, the town plan? Phase two? Yeah, but there's um, I think some of these regulations could be um, taken from some other towns uh, and maybe implemented in the, I don't want to say short term, but near term. Nothing's quick when you have to update your bylaws. The implication being that uh, some of these uh, curb cuts and the uh, lack of a swale uh, where the driveway comes into the town road does impact. Uh, yeah. And let's at least make sure we're not making it worse going forward. Okay. All right. Uh, Alyssa. I'll just name, I think, the select board and our willingness to adopt said regulations is a big piece of that because this, the Planning Commission had that draft language when they did this first bylaw rewrite and said, eh, we're going to wait on this for now. So I think us making the note that we would be willing to adopt that is really important. Um, and I'll just note that our meeting on July 29th, maybe this goes on the menu in terms of being um, upfront about kind of the range of options and all the different groups working on it. Good idea. Um, I just wanted to, she hates when I do it, publicly thank Liz, but also crew, and just acknowledge that our long-term recovery committee has been working since last July and was working with folks actively through December and through this being declared. Um, it's a volunteer board. What's happening is largely volunteers who are picking up this work and just um, we're in the place we are today because of them. So just thank you to them for all mm -hmm. Roger? Yeah. Can I ask one clarifying yeah, question? Um, Wood was talking about the calculation that's being made with the AOT district office about the road um, damage value. And then Liz is talking about the individual assistance calculation that's being made with people making these 211 reports. Are those two separate numbers that the state has to consider, or do, the, do the, those get combined? I believe they're separate. Okay. And, I mean, if you want a little bit more, right, so public assistance is the um, 
municipal roads and bridges. It also includes public buildings and buildings owned by nonprofits get included in that bucket. There's no question, I think, right? But and Vermont has gotten many public assistance disaster declarations over the years. Getting an individual assistance declaration is harder. Okay. The decision is more opaque, right? The public assistance is a very clear, like this number. If we were to say, for example, that it is just a dollar figure for individual assistance, right? A basement, you know, your mechanical's in the basement is 15 grand, 7,000 basements, right? You're gonna come up with some money there. That is not how FEMA does it. They do not reveal how an individual assistance declaration um, is um, awarded. So we don't know what the secret sauce is. But we know it does have to do with per capita, right? A certain amount of dollar amount per capita, like the, mm -hmm. in, in a by county. It's, it's definitely complicated, but again, the more we can get people to report, no one, like, the, it is just a numbers information. Someone asked me the other day if, like, they kept track of what happened on your property, so someone could come and say, years later, you didn't do it right. No, I will tell you that for sure. That is not what happens with that data. Um, they're just making an estimate of, if you say, Henry Huff Road is in my yard, that's a $50,000, $100,000 problem, whatever, and they're making I think Mike is going to give us back that road. <laughs> We're taking it. <laughs> Through his generosity, yeah, yeah. we get our road back. Right, but not every town does. <laughs> uh, Chris. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like most of the damage this time was basements flooding. Did On my road, that's true. <laughs> I don't know how the rest of that. Right. Just not the basements every... flooding. Well, that's what we had most of in j last July as well. There are absolutely properties where their house was affected you know, right, right at the first floor level. So I guess my question is, is um, Bill Shefflock, or you had mentioned that Bill might want to get together with me and would look at some of these issues uh, to figure out maybe possible solutions. What are all that, the things that, that people never, could do, right? That never came to fruition at that meeting. Uh, I guess my question is, is, is trying to re continue to recover these buildings that are being affected, is that just an insurmountable task and it's time to maybe sell everything to FEMA and move on and what does that look like? I think you're too agenda. -ized. Feels like a great segue. <laughs> yeah. and I think oh. something in between. Sorry, no, no, you're right. That is, and, and part of that, I just want to help you understand, like, there's, there's two pieces to that, right? There's what the town can do with the floodplain regulations, which is to say, you know, this is substantial damage, and you can't fix this until you do X and Y, right? There's buildings. Thankfully, not here in Waterbury, but in the surrounding area that we've seen and been talking to where they're not fixable, right? right? And then we're talking a, a building code violation, right? A building code, what they call a red tag. You can't come back from a red tag. You can't fix your house up here. Your town decides, or, or the state gives you a red tag. Like, that's not, we don't have that problem. I don't think we have those. But, um, and then there's the homeowner's decision. If it is not substantial damage or a red tag, they have to decide what to do, right? There was a news report from Barry yesterday where people were saying, I would go for a buyout. I cannot find another place to live. So, okay. that's, so that's one of my questions. Yeah. So I was looking at the two buildings that the FEMA just purchased or the town owns now, right? <coughs> These two here. Not yet. Here. Not yet. Not yet. No, no, we yeah, I I'm thinking to myself as a contractor, Knowing, I could have taken out that that property over there and put something there that would be flood resistant. Uh, probably, and I was just talking to my sister-in-law, my wife there before we came down. That what I had envisioned there was 
two foundations on either side of each other and then connect the two together with perhaps three units or six units or something like that. But, and I'm thinking to myself, is that something that <coughs> are we willing to invest in that type of a project knowing full well that the garage area underneath, you know, that that's yeah. all it would be, just open, so, almost like a carport type thing. So those homeowners applied for the buyout, the select board approved it. The process from there is it goes into the FEMA meat grinder, and I'm told nine to 12 months, we don't have an answer in any property yet. After nine to 12 months, FEMA gives the homeowner a number, which they can accept or reject. If they accept it, I'm told it's a not unreasonably long, very normal real estate closing process. In fact, there's a benefit, I think, because property doesn't have to pay a real estate agent. You might want to hire your own attorney, but that's pretty cheap in the grand scheme. The, the two properties you speak of, and actually the, the one in the middle, um, there's three pro there's, there's two vacant properties, one in the middle, he's also applied for a buyout, that was more recent. Um, but the two vacant properties were substantially damaged, so the town issued a formal declaration of that which means um, you can't reoccupy them unless you rebuild them two feet above the floodplain. So what, so that two feet above the floodplain means all utilities and living space. So absolutely, someone could buy those properties today and do that. Um, before the buyout. Before the buyout. They're, they're not owned by us. Um, once the buyout is done, it is green space forever. Um, so people can do that, um, it's just the and there are FEMA funds for the elevation, but the elevation takes years to accomplish, call it three years, four or five years maybe. Um, there's a cost benefit analysis, which, which um, in short, I, I forget the exact number, but it's about, I should know it because I heard it a thousand times, but it's about 210,000. Yeah. If you're over 88. that. 288. 288, so they raised it? Yeah, like last year, but we haven't yeah. had it yet. Yeah. If you're over their number, even if um, you're willing to pay the difference, they deem you infeasible. So you're not eligible for it at all. Um, now, the, the checklist I have to get through a FEMA elevation project is six pages long. So very complex, very time consuming. Anyone pursuing it should understand that and should know that they're likely to have to invest a lot of their own energy and money to get through the process, which is why they're rare. Um, you know, a couple of homeowners I've talked with have suggested it's easier for them to just do it than not deal with FEMA. The other challenge we have if you go down to Elm Randall is a historic district. So, you know, adding a bump out on your house to maybe put your utilities in is subject to the historic district review. Um, I imagine they're going to have something to say if you want to put your house up a story. Mm -hmm. It's either that or completely lose it for good. I mean, I guess so, that's, that's the question you that. Or are we willing to completely lose that number of housing stock and, and how do you replace that or you don't? Uh, and what's the disadvantage of continuing to try to change things in those areas like building something up high enough so that, you know, every once in a while you're going to get your garage flooded out but your living space is up 10 feet in the air or better. And, and you're not going to have to worry about it. Are people yeah. willing to live in those types of circumstances? I guess it's really a, a pick your poison type uh, question here. Yeah. Um, but I was talking to another friend of mine, Chris Gendro, who's both been in the construction industry for a long time. And didn't you say that it was uh, FEMA was paying or offering 167 thousand to elevate? <coughs> No houses. No. What was the two twenty eight? I just yeah, two twenty eight. Well, two hundred twenty eight. That's L no, no. It is that that's is the, the maximum. whole that's project cost all in. So for, obviously per house, right? So a, a manufactured home, you can elevate for two twenty eight. My house. Twenty five hundred square foot stick built house with three different structures put together over 150 years is a little So that's tougher. it, period, Yes. per unit? Well, you, per can, there, there's some special exemptions for historic houses, but as Tom said, I mean, we do want to say, historic preservation has would like to work on this with us. It won't make it faster. 
Because even at that, the lower number, I mean, one of the things that Chris Gendro does is a lot of old structure reconstruction. He didn't think, think that those costs were, were um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it wasn't necessarily underfunded. In other words, I, us guys in the residential business don't require the amount of money that these commercial outfits require to do something. We, you know, we're like vicious little dogs. <coughs> <laughs> I think that's a different so agenda. Always the odds, you know? So the people that want to pursue an elevation, um, in the end, it's actually a grant to the town. The homeowner has to put up their 25% that is held in escrow by the town. The town would pay the contractors. Typically, the town will put it out to bid. Um, so if we reach that stage with property owners, local contractors can bid on it. It doesn't have to be a you know, some big out-of-state firm. Um, and it's really up to the homeowner as to what the elevation means. I mean, they can look at jacking up the entire house. They can, mm -hmm. um, in theory, they can abandon the first floor and, and add a third floor. Um, that's up to them and, and their architects to figure out. But yeah, the town the town will put it out to bid at some point. Okay, if we got a large number of <coughs> housing stock that we end up losing, obviously the tax revenue falls on the mm -hmm. remainder that's here, probably uh, and then what happens to those people that were in those buildings? You know, where do they go? <laughs> because there's not a lot of available extra lots out there to pick from right now. Yeah. So. And okay. I just want to say, Chris, right? This is like figuring out all the things, whether it's you know waterproofing your basement or doing a wet floodway underneath. We have people who did that; it worked really well for them. Right, so every option has to be on the table for people, and they need to know what they can choose from and where the funding will come from to do it. Right, that's the real thing. You know, because of course we want to retain the houses. Like these are the neighborhoods we love. Okay. All right. Yeah, King. Um, if I may respond to Chris for a moment, um, if you want to talk about knocking down abandoned buildings and replacing them with floodproof housing. I will legitimately have conversations with you about that and we can come up with a plan. I bet people are going to be a lot more willing to fund it now than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're spending, yeah. uh, we're going to have a third meeting this month uh, on the 29th. Uh, we're going to be focusing on all of these flood issues. Uh, so. Anything else to report on flood recovery response uh, right now? No yeah, Alyssa. Alert on the homepage of the town website, watergradevt.com. So it goes to the Google Doc that's being updated tomorrow and Wednesday. Volunteer sign up is in there. The how to report um, locally to 211 links are in there. The mental health resources are in there. Um, so crew is working to keep that updated as a resource. Great. Anything else? All right. Let's move on to uh, hazard mitigation grant pre application. Yep. Um, so the, the program that funds, um, in essence, the program that gives us the, the cash to hire the engineers, the hydrologists to do the uh, hazard mitigation studies um, is called, uh, um, it's called the Hazard Mitigation Grant. There's a pre-application due August 16th. Um, the pre-application is essentially conceptual. You've got to write a paragraph per, per item. The state has encouraged us to submit all of our concepts. Um, and then they would, they would narrow that list down. We would work with our engineers. Um, and I've hired Roy Schiff with SRI <coughs> and his firm. And Roy did the hydrology study after Irene, so he's familiar with the area. We're doing a drive around with him tomorrow morning, but hired him. Um, Roy would, um, in essence, refine the scope for us and refine the cost. So when we get to the final application phase, which will be early 2025, we'll have a pretty good idea of what it all costs, um, and so will the state. Mm -hmm. um, planning the meeting on the 29th, but I just wanted to give a, give a short laundry list of concepts. Yeah. So if there's any additional ones, and these are really staff-driven concepts. Um, some big, some small. Uh, the first one, which is the bigger one, is the project of the state cornfield, which I think has been discussed by a lot of people. I was struck by 
It's a picture that Gordon Miller took and shared with the roundabout, and you can see Randall Street and the flooding, um, and the center of the cornfield is dry. Public. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that's always been the case. I've been told that for Irene it was more level. But it seems to be rising in the middle. I think every flood deposits more material. <laughs> So there's there's that, and I think there's a there's a broader concept about perhaps lowering it further and having Roy Schiff study that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other concept we'd like to explore about the cornfield is perhaps using fill from the cornfield to build uh, some form of earthen levee that would, in theory, run from Hope Cemetery um, and connect to the state complex. Um, anytime you're dealing with with the river. Um, and constricting a floodplain, and technically, even though we'd be protecting neighborhoods, you're constricting a floodplain. But the immediate reaction of the floodplain managers is, no, you can't do that. I think you've got to bypass the floodplain managers and go to their bosses sometimes. Um, but what Roy can also assist us with is, okay, if you restrict the floodplain, that may be acceptable if there's if there's not an unacceptable push-pull elsewhere. So if you restrict the floodplain and there's more of an impact on a spot in the river that is not, you know, it's not occupied by anyone or any important infrastructure, that may be perfectly fine. If you restrict it and Richmond is a lot worse, that's obviously a different story. Right. So I think having the hydrologist um, explore those issues is gonna be um, useful. The other um, big picture item, we wanna try to figure out, which strikes me as, as very fixable, are the storm source. Um, I learned the lesson last July when I was standing near one and the water started to percolate up and you know it occurred to me that a gravity fed storm sewer is gravity fed and when the river's higher it's higher than fire station, the Wesley Church and other places. Um, yes, in, uh, in, the night of the 10th Liz and I walked around yeah. and I was looking in the storm drain. <laughs> and that's how we used to see how the river was going. Well, this is what Tom did last year. In talking to uh, Alec Tuscany he has suggested that um, Backflow valves wouldn't work because the, the flow rates are too low to really activate the valves. Hmm. Um, he didn't have any immediate creative suggestions to it, but it strikes me as something that appears to be solvable. You've got to be able to put some sort of a backflow in the system that you could, you could close when the river was rising, and then of course you need to raise it um, when, when things go the other way. You've got to have some control over it. It's got to obviously have some sort of power supply. But it just strikes me as a, you know, some creative, some creative engineer yeah. can find some well, sort of solution there. I think um, even a float valve could uh, do the trick. And and if you think about this this flood, um, if that was in place, um, the bottom of Randall and Allen is probably unaffected. Union Street is unaffected, but Bargain Boutique over to the church, fire station area, um, has no well, water supplies. Very sport, so um, you know, once you hit I think 425 or so, there's essentially a stream near the fire station that goes straight onto Main Street. But anything below that, you're doing some good. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of high on our list that we've we've theorized as staff. Um, next one I talk about is Route Two. Um, I think the same thing happened this time as December, which is the homes on Route 2 um, down that way, the Butt 89. Um, there are backyards, they're generally on slabs. Um, those homes saw water before the homes um, the closer to the river. And if you look at the floodplain map, it's a bit of an odd horseshoe, and that those areas are more in the floodplain. And some of it appears, at least to me as a layperson, all that water comes off the hill, all the water comes off 89, and flows towards the village before exiting the uh, culvert. And so maybe that's another solution that's, you know, maybe there's a way to, to not solve it, but improve it. Mm -hmm. um, probably a tough place to put in additional culverts given you've got Forest Field, you've got private property, you've got State Road, um, but perhaps not impossible. Right. And I think the story that we're hearing in so many places is whatever larger culverts are, they're probably not large enough. Um, and then, a lot of um, a lot to think about with uh, the sore plant. Um, in talking to the state, um, they encouraged me to submit one application, even though the sore plant is owned by EFA, because it all benefits the same property owners, and there's no point in 
administering two grants and going through all the paperwork, both for us or for them. Um, mm -hmm. The hydrology study done a decade ago essentially went from the SOAR plant um, to the ice center. And the real focus was on mitigation projects that would reduce flooding in the downtown. Um, they did not have LIDAR da data available when they did that study, so there's much more precise data now, and that alone will, will give us some better answers, I think. But we've asked them to look at the SOAR plant. Um, the SOAR plant sits on a 39-acre parcel, most of which is is fields. So there's some thought about lowering the fields to give the sore plant some protection. I think we all have heightened awareness after the Johnson sore plant washed out and was offline for a long time. Um, now his immediate reaction to that was, you gotta be careful, the more you lower the lands, the more you invite flooding, and that can have its own impact. Um, Are the fields used for anything? Not currently, we brush hog them. They were used, they used to be used to spread fludge on them, and I believe corn was grown some years back, but that hasn't happened for a while. Mm -hmm. And Woody, correct me if I'm wrong, we're still permitted for that if we chose to do it. Correct. So we want to look do at the Do you need to spread the sludge? We need to get rid of the sludge. So right now the sludge goes to Canada, where it's actually used in, in mine uh, reclamation. They're the old asbestos mines. They're just filling mines with sludge. Filling mines up in asbestos and yep. affecting mines. Nice. The other, um, the other main concern we had about the sore plant was um, the last, all really the last three floods, um, the lagoon walls were not breached, but we had siphons and pumps running in the lagoons, um, essentially directly discharging into the river. I would consider that water partially treated because it did spend some time in the lagoon system. Um, but when you typically do two, 250,000 gallons a day of treatment and you're up to a million, you can only do so much. Um, we were thinking about... The um, million is because water <coughs> was coming in through breaches in the sewer? It, so, so mostly it's, it's water, yeah, it's water infiltration, so it's not increased sewage per se, but it's getting in there the same way. Mm -hmm. um, We've thought about um, buying a, a big trash pump. We've borrowed from Stella a big trailer mounted trash pump. Um, something that can hold, that can pump in the range of uh, 1,500 gallons a minute, 1,500 gallons a minute. Those are expensive. Um, the sewer folks, the folks at the sewer plant have also thought about putting in some sort of a valve system where we can open the valve and, and protect the balloon walls that way. So valve, some sort of a small spillway um, is another option. Um, Anytime we're doing this, we're, we're, um, we're reporting um, overflows of untreated waste, and that's mm -hmm. the reality, and that's what every sewer plant is doing in these situations. Yeah, well, this is not uncommon. <laughs> this is not uncommon, so I hope the state might be amenable to that. Um, the other concern they have that they think might be something that, I don't want to use the, the word fix, but we can improve, is uh, there's a small building at the sewer plant that they call the chlorine contact chamber. And when the water gets high enough, there's a chlorine pump that can't overcome the head pressure. So again, when you're at, you know, 425 and you're directly discharging from the lagoons, does it really matter? No, but when you're at lower and you can fully treat, hopefully, it'd be nice to fully treat and discharge the chlorinated, uh, chlorinated waste. So if there's a way to somehow um, engineer a solution there, it might help us to be fully compliant more often, and again, probably probably once you're at 424, 425, it doesn't matter, but on the way up and the way down, if you can be compliant for a longer period, that's great. Um, we also want to look at the uh, manhole covers, and they, they, make, uh, they call them catch pans for the manholes, but essentially a, a better seal, I and mean, the manholes are underwater for a long period, so. And that's where the breach is coming through. You know, I can't. I can't tell you what you might be able to speculate if it's if it's more there, if it's more just groundwater infiltration. I suspect it's a combination of fifty things. Mm -hmm. But if you can reduce the flows in, it's never going to hurt. Yeah, it's everything we got. <laughs> Still have some old clay tile pipe that's porous. Um, every manhole cover. Some of the ones in the low lying areas are flood proof. You bolt them down with a catch pan and what have you. But even then. Not like a submarine or it. <coughs> um, so there, it's a it's a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. 
But our permit allows us to discharge partially treated effluent into the river. I just I don't know the technical answer. During during emergency. Oh, during an emergency. Oh, emergency. Okay. That's a that's a big yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. The last flood, the state said, do whatever you can. To get right. To so avoid like destroying yeah. the facility. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Versus you know a major catastrophic yeah. meltdown. Yeah. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying. I I heard. I said, boy, that just didn't sound right. We we could yeah. discharge that. I've heard that this happens up in Montpelier. Yeah, that's yeah, happening in a number of internal emergencies. It happens on a fairly routine basis to any major plant on the river. Um, Montpelier, Wellington, St. Albans. Several times I can use right now. They have to that. do various ways do to essentially bypass. Plainfield like has not now. They don't. <laughs> oh, okay. They, they did. They did. Okay. Um, we also want to look at Thatcher Brook. Um, and Grays Brook in a different way. The, the hydrology study that was done after Irene included Thatcher Brook that stopped at I-89. Mm -hmm. And if we can extend that further, it, it would appear to me at least to be prudent. Um, in looking at the floodplain maps, we don't, um, we don't, you know, at least until recently, I didn't think a lot about Thatcher Brook in the floodplain, but um, it's not super narrow everywhere. I think if we can use that better data to get better mapping, better understanding, mm -hmm. um, might give us some information about culverts and bridges, um, that would be useful. Woody has also identified some, some places in the brook um, after December, and I think he'll identify a few more, where um, some movement of the brook, um, there's now some, uh, some infrastructure, some water for infrastructure that's a little bit more exposed than we'd like it. So protecting that is, a, is another priority. Mm -hmm. um, keeping going down, just going down the list, and, and we can go in more detail once we get to the 29th. But um, Union Street, so there's three buyouts that have been submitted, and I haven't talked to the gentleman, but I'm, um, I've been informed that there may be a fourth coming before you pretty soon, mm -hmm. which could be the bottom four properties in Union Street. And right. there's, an assemblage of properties, it's not a lot of acreage, it's about four tenths of an acre. Uh, but, but we'd like to ask the hydrologists and engineers to see if there's some some mitigation project that could happen um, related to that acreage. And that could be, um, that to me raises some interesting concepts because the um, if there's an opportunity to do something, it could be a little bit of a re-engineering of the entire bottom of the street. So I'd like, to, I'd like for him to think about it from the perspective of maybe Union Street doesn't need to be a through street. Those four properties are done. Oh. Maybe there's some creative concept here that would, that would benefit uh, the community. Um, but increasingly, I just want to take the approach that we shouldn't be shy about um, thinking about these things. Um, for better or worse, um, congressional earmarks are back. And the beauty of the earmarks sometimes is that um, those those projects that seemed a bit audacious years before, um, maybe above the ability to, to go to the taxpayers with a bond, become a little more possible. And so I think we shouldn't shy away from from asking the engineers to be a little bit aspirational on some of these projects. Um, I also want to look at town hall. Um, technically, the basement over here and the the edge of the library is in the floodplain, which isn't a, a huge concern. Um, but our utilities on the pillars are back, at least to the, to the measurements I can get, are two feet above the floodplain, which is the standard. Mm -hmm. The floodplain maps are in the works, um, and I was initially told revised maps would be available around this time. I'm now told there's a one-year delay, but I think we can all surmise they're not going to lower things. Right. Um, and so. I'd like to get, and this may be something that's not a FEMA project because it may be simple enough that we don't want to bother with a federal grant, but I'd like to get quotes from the engineers to, to raise those utilities at back. It's great the town hall is available for everyone and crew during a flood event. It would stink to not have air conditioning or heat in the winter. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's you know, when they, when they built town hall, this is not a criticism that 
the standard guidance is two feet over flood plain, and, and it's been that guidance since the beginning of time. Maybe we need to rethink that a little bit. Um, moving down a little further, um, it's not a huge problem this time around. I, th I think there were a handful of homes where the water was shut off. Um, part of that is because we've had the unfortunate experience of being flooded and people are getting smarter, but sometimes time takes you backwards. Um, the July flood and the December flood, a fair amount of people had to have their water shut off because things tipped over in the basement and the water lines broke uh, better this time around. Um, in the same way, Green Mountain Power informed us about the smart meters where they can be shut off remotely. Um, they have the, they have um, they have electronic shut off valves for water, so we can log online and shut off individual homes. Normally, those are sold to water systems as something you buy for problem customers. And if you wanna you wanna shut them off, um, you don't need to knock on the door necessarily and, and have that confrontation. Um, mm -hmm. They're not cheap, they're three, four hundred dollars to buy. Um, they've still got to be installed and then you've got to pay a, you know, you've got to pay a, a monthly or an annual fee for the system. But it, I think it's a prudent thing to think about if we can shut off the neighborhood when the water's up and then and then not have to worry about it. Um, Smart move. You know, I don't recall the flows offhand, but I, I believe in, I believe last July our water plan essentially produced double for a few days, and a lot of that was just going straight into the results. Do you recall those numbers, please? I think we were at No, we're at 360,000 today or yesterday, which is 50 or 60 over what would normally be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have gotten progressively better. Irene, it was a huge problem, these last ones. Uh, more so for some of our Duxbury Mortown customers who <coughs> didn't experience flooding before. And, and all these, and these are just our sort of internal staff concepts. I'm sure we'll talk to Roy Schiff and, and his team and get more. And we're hoping on the 29th people can give us additional ideas to think about. Um, Is Roy going to be available on the 29th? I believe so. In person or so? I hope, I hopefully in person. And, and it's a it's a big engineering firm, so if Roy's not, you know, Roy's got a whole team behind him. He could send a. Yeah, so yeah. essentially, they can handle any of these items. He's not—he's the hydrologist, but the team is—is is a full-service engineering firm. So, uh, will uh, public input on the 29th have any impact on this pre-application process? Yeah, because the pre-application—we don't need dollar amounts. We simply need concepts. Uh -huh. um, so, and, and you know, the one we had tonight, I mentioned the planning commission. And maybe we should look at some some bylaw changes. I didn't think of, of that as a concept influencing the July 29th meeting, but Alyssa immediately said, "No, let's let's put that on the agenda." And I think that makes sense. So I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of ideas, and I think after the 29th, it won't be super hard to crystallize them into to one application. Other questions? Uh, others? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in regarding uh, your concepts, there was one you brought up last July about a giant culvert on Winooski <coughs> that so I feel like was missing from this presentation. Winooski so Street. Winooski Street, yes. We, we, looked at that, we looked at that with FEMA. It, it, it's funny what FEMA has paid for. So very quickly, as in three months or so, FEMA repaid us for the damages, and the, the short-term fixes to Winooski Street, and the other culvert we lost on Greg Hill. Um, that's the, actually the only money we've gotten in so far from FEMA. Um, but then, I believe it was December. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was, I don't recall the time frame, but FEMA called me and Woody and Celia um, and said, come up with some, some more permanent fixes to those two projects and, we'll, and give us your estimate and we'll get you a check. And so literally four or five days later, um, we got some quotes for better armoring the culvert on Greg Hill and for Winooski Street. Um, the suggestion was was gabions, which was essentially the metal cages that mm -hmm. you fill with you fill, fill with, with stone and um, and lining the street with them. And so they actually paid us for that already. Um, it was something like ten, twelve thousand dollars. So 
you know, the joke we had was after this flood was that, well, we had to excavate the sides of the road before putting in the gabions, and that's half done for us already. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it wasn't the worst thing, but I think that'll, I think that'll help. I, you know, I think time will tell whether or not it's a, it's a long-term fix. Um, Any time <coughs> horizon for that project? Um, as soon as we can. It's, it was. I hoped it was going to be done pretty soon, but other priorities have happened um, before the winter sets in. I think it's not a hugely time-consuming project. But before the end of the year. Yeah, it was a question just in terms of process, um, thinking ahead to the 29th. Um, Tom, you emailing all of us as select board, what would be the best method for someone in the public to submit a project? I'm just thinking of myself personally having this menu of options, so to speak, on paper um, might be useful just in terms of um, being able to discuss what's going into the bucket of the hazard mitigation grant, what are things that boards and committees and groups in the community might want to take on and kind of doing that sorting, <coughs> recognizing the 29th is not going to be the whole conversation. And if folks come with ideas on the 29th, we're certainly happy to hear them too. But I'm just thinking of sourcing things ahead of time and <coughs> what most might be most effective to kind of filter those. I don't want to flood your inbox. Oh, sorry, no, bad no, word. Um, if you don't want, um, <laughs> I'm willing if someone else, but just thinking of how we kind of synthesize some of that ahead I think, of time. I think me and Woody. I'm taking Woody off, sorry. I love you, but I want nothing else in Woody's inbox besides what Woody already has to do. Sorry, is that okay? <laughs> so if you're in the public and have an idea that you didn't hear on the list here tonight regarding something you think would be a worthwhile hazard mitigation grant, please feel free to email it to our manager, T. Lights. His email is on the website. Please be mindful he's also a busy man doing many wonderful things for the community, um, but just trying to get as much as we can ahead of time um, for the 29th. Here. And if I, I think that's mm -hmm. the group's one, right? Right, I, I do think, right, we want to encourage this portion of the session on the 29th. Tom and I have talked about, like, crew helping facilitate this portion of brainstorming session, giving people the opportunity, um, you know, to weigh in on things. There are, you know, additional suggestions that have come up many times. This is a popular topic in the <coughs> community. So whether it's emailing Tom or also, you know, just that these will be in the notes Right, and um, you, know, you could probably just also make a, a document people could write in. For people who can't make the meeting, right? But there's, um, I think it will be a great opportunity. To, you, you know, there was, um, uh, Brian Kravitz had a note, you know, in the roundabout, Eric Gross had a response, like the conversation is happening. So it's really just about making sure people get the opportunity to put it forward. Um, and also the challenges. But we're going to focus mostly, I think, on what are the ideas. I love, Tom, that you just said that it's a paragraph, because that really gives yes. us a lot of flexibility. Yeah. We don't have to kick the tires of every concept. Great. Anything else on uh, hazard mitigation grant preauthorization? Uh, can I raise a point? Yeah, just, just in terms of ideas. Uh, and Woody, I might, you and I spoke about this. Um, on Perry Hill and somewhere else, the culverts didn't fail. The creek and all the debris from upstream clogged the, the culverts. Mm -hmm. And then the water jumped the culverts and wiped out Perry Hill, and Mike obviously stole the road. But I guess in terms of all the ideas to think about, how, how do you protect the mouth of the culverts? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, you can't just put a screen in front of them. But in terms of the yeah. ideas. They did the same thing right through. down the... Uh, it's the uh, state complex when they put in those swells, and that would the big screens. Well, maybe maybe you can. Then. The other thing is, if you guys have these think meetings on Monday night, I don't want to sound like I'm whining, but planning commission can't attend because we meet on Monday the Monday nights that you don't, and I'm pretty sure that we have a meeting on the 20th. <coughs> so when you have these sessions, I think my colleagues would like to attend if we can. So I was, might be too late to change it now, but next time you do this, it'd be great. Kind of not to run a money. Just a point of information. Uh, just to just to comment a little bit. Um, I've been in the local government world now, not as long as Woody, but a couple decades, and culverts be devil and culverts and ditches are the bedevilment of every road crew. Um, now there's a lot of time cleaning. You know, ditches have to be ditched and redone 
all the time. Culverts have to be cleared. Um, you know, to my knowledge, at least, there's no there's no machine where you can just drive down the road and kind of clear the ditch easily. They just don't don't really make yes. it. Right. Um, That's what I was thinking. This guy's the way to clean them. I so mm -hmm. my, the failure on Perry Hill. I'd never seen that before. I've never seen so much small. I mean, you see big trees or branches. Never see so much small debris. It looked like a wood. Somebody came with a wood chipper and basically chipped the entire woods and then just dumped it in front of the car. Mm -hmm. It just was. I just. I. I don't even know how to think about how that happened because typically, Graves Brook is just all the big trees falling. There's there's no small stuff in there. So I don't I don't know how it got there. So. Well, was, the water came down all fast, so now there was a clear sheet yeah. of water bringing every. Yeah. Every movable item downhill. Sure. The state's 80% forested now, as opposed to years ago, where farm mm -hmm. farmland. I, mean, I would like to see some sort of solution where we are allowed to go enter private property upstream of one of our culverts without, you know, big hurdles to leap over. You know, um. come on, mine anytime. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Billy. I do not see a planning commission meeting on the 29th. It's ah. not on the calendar, so hopefully that does allow <coughs> for them to attend. Of course, I'll make note that my meeting's not on the calendar either. <laughs> it's a fifth Monday, so we were sneaking in right, the next garage. We heard Billy. At least on the surface. Melissa here. Yeah. Yeah. Melissa, Last night, just offhand, quick, Tom, are bridges an eligible thing? <coughs> bridges are certainly eligible. Um, I think Woody mentioned that um, we've had our bridges looked at by engineers and, and have not identified any, any issues. I know a number of people have expressed to me um, concerns about the bridges on Guptal and how they, you know, the, the water is pretty close to the bridges. Um, Alec, at least internally, has said um, they don't particularly appear to concern him for what that's worth. But, Mm -hmm. of, I don't know if it was Bill Shovelick's biggest disappointment that this one wasn't included in Main Street Reconstruction. And certainly I'm not an engineer, but in aspirational projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else on uh, the um, pre the pre application? <coughs> Did somebody have their hand on? Mm -hmm. That's That's nice. <laughs> I already talked. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move oh, on. Thank you. Uh, FEMA buyouts. This has already been brought up, but uh, what else do we need to? Uh... And bef before we have a sort of the broader discussion, I have yep. two specific ones. If I can just share my screen here. Okay. Yeah. It says not turned on. Really? One participant can share. I'm going to make it multiple for you. There we go. Let me share the right one. So here's a. First one, gentleman came in last week. Um, he did fill out the paperwork, um, and Karen has it. Uh, his address is 1634 US Route 2. Um, and so this is his parcel. This is the floor plan map. Let me zoom out for just a minute to give you a little more perspective. Um, so, you know, Jenny Davis down here, Little River right here. So he's mm -hmm. right in the thick of it. And again, he abuts 89. Yep. So it's telling in a way that. Um, we're not hearing as much from property owners necessarily in this area, um, but from someone that abuts 89. So he's filled it out. Um, grand list value is $189,100, um, so not a, not a huge hit um, at our 55 and a half cent tax rate. Um, and in having the conversation, um, he's getting older, he's just exhausted from dealing with it all. and he. He wants to sell and move, but he also feels like, um, he was very frank, he feels like the buyout is um, a better option because he doesn't want to sell it to someone else and have them go through what he's gone through recently. So he's hoping the FEMA number will be acceptable. Mm -hmm. I believe Bill Sheplick and I went out and visited that property <coughs> on the 11th, and the house itself was the island. It was completely surrounded by water on all sides. There was no way in or out. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. 
Uh, and uh, so, uh, are we going? To, you're asking for us to vote on uh, accepting that tonight. I'm accepting that. Um, I'll move to approve the FEMA buyout application for 1634 U.S. Route 2 in Waterbury. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That FEMA buyout application is approved. And then there was a second specific right. application. Right. Hasn't filled out the paperwork yet, but. Um, 17 Randall, it sometimes shows on the map as 15 Randall. It is a duplex. So it's a different, it's the first uh, Randall Street buyout, mm -hmm. um, Kravitz property. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in talking to him today um, and Friday, um, with each flood, he said six figure damage. Um, doesn't, doesn't reach that 50% damage threshold. It's a pretty valuable property, but significant damage. Um, some of his income is from renting that half the duplex, and so it's a challenge for him. He, you know, he's got to spend all this money, he loses rent at the same time. Um, elevating a duplex, as we've talked about, is going to be complex. The historic district issues um, for him are complex. He actually emailed me during the meeting and said um, it was a huge issue for him to do just a bump out for the utilities and deal with historic district issues. Is it going to be easier if, you, if he elevates? And I thought, I said to him, no, plain and simple, no. Um, hmm. The historic district review folks might have something to say if a, store, if a house has raised a story on, on Randall Street. Um, so he is interested in a buyout. Um, he just, I think in, in the end, it's a similar story. Um, expensive to, to, expensive to, to make his house more resilient, um, challenging to, to finance us all, and, and is just interested in getting the number. Mm -hmm. Question. Um, if the historic preservation is going to have problems with um, having people elevate their properties, how are they going to feel if they're all, they're, they're all destroyed in some way, shape, or form with FEMA buyouts? I'm not, I'm not sure problems. I mean, you know, Sometimes, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. And, and their, their job is to try to preserve the, the character of the neighborhood. Right. And I think they're walking a fine line just as much as anyone and trying to, trying to navigate this issue. What they told us in January when yeah. they met, the Department of the Interior, FEMA, Historic Preservation came and did a walkthrough with Tom and the crew was that what they would love would be a group solution. Right, where we were doing similar things, at least in a neighborhood that had similar design specs, and they were willing to work to help on that. Right, I, we know from the um, elevation workshop we did in April that the estimates people were getting on Randall Street a decade ago were still more than the limit. So. The right. concern is about the additional cost of trying to m make it look right. Um, you know, I mean, I still, we have not, I know from a crew standpoint, we have not talked to Historic Preservation about a bump out. And, you know, we do want to pursue that with them. And just, if, again, when I think of your house, my house, any of these houses, my kitchen was the shed on this house. So, you know, it is like, how is that different from being like we just enclose the side porch right. and, and put the, you know, utilities there? It's historic to do that on an old house. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make that case to them. Because mm -hmm. they've had neighborhoods in Savannah, Charleston, New Orleans, yes. where they have entire neighborhoods, you know, like <coughs> after Katrina, they had to do, you know, in some of these wards, you know, you would have nothing or you would build these things up and you recreate them and it just I think it's very short sighted of the ship up. They haven't said no. They I want to be no. clear okay. about that. This is not a no situation. This is people are exhausted at the thought of okay. figuring it out. Um, I'm not echoing Mike. I think what I'm saying is a little different and this does not affect a yes or no vote. I just wanted to 
bring it into part of the conversation as we start considering FEMA buyouts in our downtown districts, all the while dealing with a housing crisis in the same district, you know, the same, same downtown area. With a FEMA buyout, we're never going to be able to use that property again. Right. And so, well, is yeah. it worth it to us to consider a buyout or try and find a buyer who would do something that maybe Chris suggested, where we construct a building that's flood proof mm -hmm. instead of never being able to use that piece of land again? And uh, one of the things that Tom just mentioned was uh, excavating the cornfield and potentially right. putting in a levee, which would also impact that entire area. Right. The question yep. with your cornfield and levee project. And all uh, can you go forward, please? Yeah, yes, sorry. I live on Randall Street. You're right. Neighbor. Um, my name's Ryan Deneen. You were talking about historical district kind of wants it as like one grand project. If you were to propose raising people's houses, keeping the character of the neighborhood the same, ripping down the field, filling in all the things so that it now looks, mm -hmm. the, the neighborhood itself could be the berm, right? As opposed to creating some separate berm that is now not historical, the whole neighborhood could be the berm if it has to be something like, and I know that number is, I mean, it's probably as astronomical as building the berm in the first place, right? Or ripping the field down, but also then you take care of the whole problem of where to put all that dirt, because that's gonna cost money, where are we gonna put it all, who wants all that dirt? If you actually just bring the whole thing up and then, you know, ease it into where the state is, and you could build a road that kind of humps over at one spot just to get to the back parking lot or something, but I mean, I may suggest that on the 29th. But that would be like a grand list, keeping historical preservation. The whole neighborhood would look exactly like it looks, but now raised five and a half, six feet, so that 425 is not a problem. Nobody maybe has a basement anymore, great. Um, and then maybe just some consideration to put like a four by six bump out on any house so that we can stick a water heater and a heating unit. I think you could probably fit into all those plans. I could certainly write up a plan like that if you'd like that. But, <coughs> but that solves a lot of problems, I think, with like, take material away. Where do we put the material? Right. Grading the whole thing so then that back ditch is still all there. It's still pushing all the water the way it's supposed to. Hopefully making no real downstream effect on Richmond. Mm -hmm. It's maybe cutting off some of the flooding going into town which we're talking, what, sometimes like two feet, so trillions of gallons of water per like whatever, probably not really hydrologically like affecting downstream, so. Just hearing your ideas as we go, if we have to make it all one project, solve it all in one big thing, pull everything back, mm -hmm. do that, no more basements, no more pumping, no more one in the streets for everyone, so. Yeah, no, I think that's an elegant solution. The challenge is, um, Getting someone to agree with us. Getting the whole yeah, major different homeowners, agree. different priorities. It's going to be tough. Well, I think most of the homeowners down there don't want to be flooded anymore, so I think we're all pretty wide open to yeah. if the historical team says we got to do something, then mm -hmm. my mind's open. Cool. All right. Can I yes, Kate. Okay. Just one more question here. Um, even if we agree to this buyout request, I feel as though with projects that attempt to save the neighborhood from future flooding, we would essentially be racing the clock against FEMA um, to see if we could get the project done before the buyout's complete. Yeah. If FEMA approves the buyout. Right. And if the dollar amount is sufficient. Right. I don't think you should punish that guy. No, right, exactly. And also people can change their mind. Yeah. And we, when we can work to help them change his mind, if that's a desire to do a, do a more community-wide project. Mm -hmm. Gary. Yeah. Uh, Gary? Yeah, I, I like um, <coughs> the, the at least concept of trying to figure stuff out. 
And I think elevating the houses is a great idea. Probably most people are not going to be able to do that. But if you put a berm there, that creates a bottleneck. Just like the bottleneck that's around the corner, which causes a lot of the water here. So if you put another bottleneck in, won't that just push the water around from the other end of the village? Not saying it's not worth looking at, yeah, but anytime you create a bottleneck, that water is going to go somewhere. It's not all going to just flow downstream. It's going to back up, which is what we have over here. So I'm just encouraging you to look at all the options. And I think exploring stuff is great, but I'd be, and I don't know that the state would allow you to put a berm in just because of that reason. So I just thought I'd throw that out. Yeah, none of this is easy to accomplish. No, absolutely not. And the answer to all of it at first blush by the state is probably no. Right. And you've got to push from there. So I, if we can create a berm all the way along the Winooski <laughs> on this side, mm -hmm. then it becomes somebody else's problem. And is that what we want to do as being neighbors? And to give, to give just an idea on, on elevation at my, my first count, um, 31 properties on Randall Street in the floodplain. Another six or seven on Elm. So if you're talking a community-wide project, you know, call it 40 structures roughly that you've got to raise at three, 400 grand a pop. Right. So you're six, eight million dollars pretty quickly. Doesn't mean it's impossible, that's just as I said before, with it's a good time to be aspirational. Mm -hmm. those congressional All right. Uh, you looking for a response on the Kravitz request? A response, or um, you know, this him and I were just talking Friday and today. So if you mm -hmm. like him to come in here at a future meeting to flesh it out further, if you don't feel you have enough information, we can schedule that. Yeah, uh, I've, I guess from my perspective, it's a bit of a different situation because it's uh, a house right in the middle of Randall Street, uh, and uh, I, th I think it, it does require a bit of a larger conversation. Um, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but if uh, somebody <coughs> wants to, uh, I think we could just uh, encourage him. We will have a warrant meeting on the 29th. Uh, could uh, bring it up then. Okay. Yeah, Mike. Just in response, I thought Gary's comments were, were good ones. Um, I think if you have a berm kind of the length of town, you're channelizing the water in the in the in the river, which you know again, do we start? You know that that's what has created problems in a lot of other areas in the country. Yeah, and we, we had that conversation with the hydrologist, and, and right. that's, that's what he said is you, you, doing that is always a challenge if you can do it in a manner that doesn't impact someone negatively upstream or downstream. It is, it you is have to have a possible. berm where eventually it, it disperses somewhere into some sort of a floodplain that will accept that water versus just moving on down to Bolton and yeah. Richmond, and you know, and just you'll have way more impacts there. So I think. It, that would be a real challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You know, one, one thing to take into consideration is that uh, that berm wouldn't come from anywhere. It would be excavating right, uh, right, uh, right. volume in the field, so sensibly the water would have more room in the field. And then, uh, again, that's why we hire the engineers to look at other impacts. Uh, perhaps there's other places for the water to go. Make Lake Waterbury in the in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes, Melissa. Um, Randall, I just wanted to check what right. So right now, the state is matching the twenty five percent local share on bios. How long is that? Mm -hmm. Until it runs out. That's that's, that's yeah. all I'm hearing. Yes, they need all the applications in by the August deadline. Okay. I'm just naming it's a different standard, and I think there's been compelling, I guess it's our full sh first multifamily, and it is a different street. I'm just noting, like, it's us as the select board wielding the power to say property owner, we're not allowing you to proceed with this program right now. We're not saying that yet. We're saying we want to have more information. But 
I think just saying it's the first one we've had that that's been our initial reaction and it's hard and it will be I'm just thinking of how we're having that conversation on the 29th and how we are have a big picture um, conversation that's just a lot but. yeah well we are dealing with a lot Yeah. Have any, uh, have any yeah. of the other uh, buyouts on Union pushed ahead, or do we have any more information? Still on waiting. Those? We're still waiting from FEMA. Okay. Um, the, the day of the flood at 2 or 3 a.m., I emailed the state's hazard mitigation officer, and I was not unkind, but <coughs> a little upset that I've been reading about other towns where the buyouts have been approved and the, the money is flowing, and we haven't heard a word. Um, I don't know the priorities once it gets to FEMA. It seems to be a bit of a, opaque is not the word, it's a black box once it gets there. When I can I can understand having some, some priorities for some communities that are harder, but I've, I've heard about layouts, a bunch of towns around the state. Uh, I will just say, Tom, like, the while there have not, no one has gotten money. <coughs> just say they were told that it will be at least a year, that the homeowners should be prepared to stay in their houses for two years was what they were told at an early workshop with Stephanie Smith um, you know, last fall. Mm -hmm. And they, so they've been operating on that, you know, the long-term recovery group and the one. Yeah. Yeah. And so something. that would probably be the whole trooper uh, Washington County as well. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Anyone else want to bring up anything more on uh, FEMA buyouts? I would just give the broader conversation about sure. some of the some of the neighborhoods. Um, I'm just pulling up. Let me share the screen again. Yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. So this is the the floodplain map overlay. Um, just starting at Route Two, and the bio you just approved was right in this area. Um, See, it's interesting that you have properties here where the, the structures are not in the floodplain, but the yards are. But in theory, I went through and just neighborhood by neighborhood, um, just just got some rough numbers to think about. But on Route 2, you've got about $2.5 million of Grand West value in the floodplain, um, which is a, a fair amount as you, um, as you scroll over. Um, and look at the rest of the town. Um, if you go down to, um, you know, Randall and Elm, Randall Street, you've got seven million dollars of, of taxable property in the floodplain, virtually all of Randall Street, um, including one property right on the end of Park Row. Um, Elm Street, excluding the commercial property, you've got two million dollars um, as you go up Elm. Um, Union Street, we've got three buyouts in the works, but the other two in the floodplain, uh, one's pursuing an elevation, one is not contact with Sheppey, you've got about a half million dollars. Um, and then a bit lost in the shuffle is O'Hare Court, which is entirely in the floodplain. Some of those are condos, so it's hard to imagine a buyout or an elevation per se, uh, but you've got another two and a half million dollars there. So you've got, you know, 14, 15 million dollars in the floodplain of your grand list just to give you some broader numbers to think about um, how you wanted to, how you might want to pursue that if other folks come forward in the next And then on the South Main, I'm mm -hmm. just naming the other structures. Yeah, there's, the there's a handful on, there's a, there's a handful on Main. There's actually um, one property, actually um, down near Butler on Main Street. Um, just one single property in the floodplain down there. Um, and then as you go, um, South Main towards the fire station. There's a couple of homes down there too. And beyond, how about uh, beyond um, near the Merritt Place? Uh, go look. So the Merritt Place is out of it, but yeah, this area of town, we did mm -hmm. hit. We did hit a couple houses there with the vector yeah. yep. last week. Um, so I didn't get quite everyone, but yeah, you've got a you've got a pretty pretty big grouping. Right. And do you have an assessment as to the value in that, <laughs> that area? 
not not immediately in this area, but you know you're developing a lot of homes. Right. Um, so you probably got two or three million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's all grain list value, not real estate values. Obviously, we probably fact double all of that. But. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, yeah. <coughs> Just question. Uh, so you're talking about 17, 18 million, maybe. Uh, how many? How many structures do you think that many units would be? <coughs> I mean, I'm curious the math a number of units into that number yields how much per unit? Um, I don't know that offhand. Um, you know, grand list values are, are depressed compared to the real world, but but our average grand list value is around 200 for this area, so. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking about the replacement cost versus, versus um, the grand list value, I guess, if it's if it's 300,000 per unit, um, <clears throat> looking at that number uh, versus what it would take to replace all those units somewhere else, uh, whether, you know, whether there's a formula there that makes it worthwhile to invest 250,000 per unit to elevate it or to do whatever it keep it there as opposed to completely eliminating it and having to do it somewhere else. What's the cost analysis difference between the two? To, you know, whether or not that would help. The other reason I make suspect, decision. Um, just some further thinking about this is this, this buyout round, which closes in August, is based on the 2023 flood. The new disaster declaration, I'm assuming and, and been told by a few people, is going to trigger another round of eligibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think, at least I've been thinking over the past six months, that there were two or three property owners that I wished would apply for buyout. Um, but now I worry that, you know, maybe the opposite could happen. Um, you know, the middle of Randall was very different from the bottom of Union, to me at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It could become become a ghost town, to be honest with you. And uh, what happens when reappraisal happens? Because these houses that have continually been impacted in such a short period of time, that's gotta that's gotta impact the, the appraisal rate on those. Uh, I gotta believe. If, I, if anything, it's gonna be going the other way here. I don't know. Um, I know the board of Worcesters. Um, met after the July flood, I don't know about December, and I think they applied some depreciation to houses in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, I know after Irene they did the same, it was pretty substantial, but they reduced it and then pretty quickly eliminated it two or three years after, and they determined that um, the real estate market didn't care. Um, and at least until recently that was also my general observation, um, just based on some recent sales. So I'm, it may just be a factor that people are so desperate for housing. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and that's, that's also the main inhibiting factor in the buyout. A number of people have talked to me and they said, well, even if I got a great number from FEMA, where am I going? There's a property in Randall that just closed for upwards of $600,000. Yeah. So, in the flood to your point, yes. the market doesn't seem to. The day before the flood. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Anything else on the buyouts? No, not for me. Okay. Well, you know, again, revisit this on the 29th. Bump out on stones for Stones Throw and PC Bagel. Yep, we didn't have any concepts to present, but I think it's easy enough to, to envision. Um, talked about this for a little bit. Um, I had talked to the owner of Casey's Bagel about um, a bump out. So when I say bump out, um, 
temporary structure placed on the road that would take up two parking spaces, mm -hmm. sufficient to allow um, a decent amount of outdoor seating. Um, Casey's closes at two. Um, her reaction was that um, she did. She said she she's been in town forever and she survived through a lot and and wasn't necessarily worried about that, but. Um, a lot of her business is pull up, run inside, get something, and leave. Right. Um, so she she was, um, you know, she didn't argue about it, but she didn't she didn't she wasn't enthusiastic. She didn't think that having outdoor seating would give her any real benefit per se. Um, um, I think Stone's Throw is, and I think Tyler, who's the owner, or one of the owners, is here. Um, I think views it very enthusiastically. Um, I, I think um, I think of a I think of a bump out in outdoor seating as bringing um, more energy, more life to the downtown. Um, some restaurants, you know, other restaurants have it already. Stone's Throw doesn't just by virtue of the location. But I think you know I think it's a multiplier in that if people see people eating outside, it just adds to the to the good vibe we have, same to the other way. So I think there's a benefit, a broader benefit um, to it. Um, I know Woody has been has been figuring out some concepts and can talk about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, the um, I think the big things from public works standpoint are that for one, it's going to be temporary, obviously um, seasonal, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, should be easily movable. <coughs> shouldn't affect the pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk. Shouldn't affect the stormwater flows, um, things like that. And there's all sorts of options you can go with, and the better, more aesthetically pleasing looking ones are obviously more costly. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are what are the costs of the town on this? Um, we can move temporary <coughs> structures in and out um, if you want. If they want something as simple as portable jersey barrier, I, I think there needs to be something substantial, at least on the leading edge, for mm -hmm. traffic. On the backside, less so. Um, yeah, you you can get Jersey barriers in there for you know, a thousand bucks, but again, they're not that good little good looking. And you know, whether that's the look you want in your downtown. Um, Sometimes we use large planters to you right. know, give that barrier and that right there. You're seeing after the not after during the pandemic. In a lot of big cities, you would see all these little, you know, it became, it was great for the restaurants. They looked at it as, you know, yeah. free additional space. But I don't know how much the town really, I think most, you know, Boston, New York City, places like that, it was pretty much, it was the restaurant was paying, paying the bill. And it wasn't too much in terms of, uh, I think I've seen somewhat, some planters and whatnot it uses, you know, for, you know, vehicle protection and stuff like that. But I agree with you, Woody. I think having a jersey barrier in front of one of those things would look very attractive. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Would, would be a big plus. Yeah, I mean, they, they get better looking. There's certain things you can do with flower boxes or what have you. Yeah. But yeah it's you, had, you had, like, in the, um, in the federal building in Burlington, more for security, they did these big concrete, yep. you know, kind of planters and stuff <coughs> like that. And they were that they're pretty they're not that ugly. Yeah. So I think that that could work. But but that would create a little bit more of a you know, if you're gonna have to move first. Um in my head I picture a bump out as like what was what's in front of positive pie in Montpelier. Um, or right. in front of Radio Bean in Burlington, right. as these big wooden structures that but take up two parking. Is the technical term? Sure, it's but that's like it, that's what I picture. If we're just going to put out flower pots with a <coughs> red velvet rope with some seating in it, I don't. Uh, sure. <laughs> I was wondering if we could ask Tyler. Uh, I think he's the one that brought this uh, uh, proposal up, so maybe we've got any, his idea on what, what the concept is and what has been being proposed. Uh, 
Um, I'll, I'll say that I, I really appreciate the proposal. Um, we, as Stones Throw and Waterbury, do not have a lot of visibility uh, to the public where we are on Stowe Street. Um, we have had some struggles with our adjoining building with... Um, um, I'll, I'll say that I, I really appreciate the proposal. Um, we, as Stones Throw and Waterbury, do not have a lot of visibility uh, to the public where we are on Stowe Street. Um, we have had some struggles with our adjoining building with um, access to our to to take out in the back of our building where previously you could drive up park and grab a pie out back the next door landlord has closed off that parking lot and uh, is not allowing uh, that use of our back area um, the 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 bump out idea would be something that would really help support our business just broadly speaking um and then uh, as far as aesthetically uh, i mean I, I i would just for one i would know not to step on my wife's feet because she does all the design work for us <laughs> but um she uh she would probably say you know as far as the town and what they're willing to make it look cohesive to the rest of the town we would obviously support and we 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 do our best to make it look and feel appropriate Toddler, if, if it was something like a parklet kind of idea would you be willing to foot the cost to invest in the structure that gets put in year in you know parts of the year that you could use because I, I don't envision the town, you know, building a structure for you. You know, I could see having some sort of traffic protection, but that would be kind of about it. If, if the town accepts that that protection is sufficient, and I don't have to necessarily build other structure, structure or it's not being dictated to us what it is and the cost has to be and I just have to worry about making it a environment people want to sit in then absolutely does that answer your question yeah it would be probably if you were going to do something it would probably be a structure that you'd have to have approved by the DRB yeah so rather than a, a, a for, for uh, the sake of, of talking about it, rather than a movable, say, safety planter or barrier, uh, it would be a full structure that would have to be assembled by the DRB and taken down by the DRB. Am I? No, they would approve what your design is. It would be your response. For for uh, the sake of of talking about it, rather than a movable, say safety planter or barrier uh it would be a full structure that would have to be assembled by the drb and taken down by the drb am i is that what you're saying <laughs> good luck on that one too yeah I, 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 i'm not i'm not quite following you it would be your responsibility to, to put it up and take it down we're we're in acronym soup land. So DRB is our design review board who would oh, okay, approve. Okay, okay, gotcha. Sorry, was... in conform to specs. I'll just say I'm on the city of Montpelier. They have a parklet program that has like a whole set of application and regs. I guess I'm balancing wanting to support Tyler in doing this and just making sure we get a product that's safe and amenable for all. Um, and works for emergency and Woody and everyone else. Um, it, do, would you come back with the design? I guess, and again, is that our purview because it's right of way, or does it just go to the area? Um, I guess we could uh, approve the use of the two parking spaces and then uh, push it forward from there. And then take it to the area. Is there a desire to tie frame in terms of seasonality? That would be a structure that um, <laughs> that public works agree during the seasonally engaged. 
Um, then I'll be part of the GRP with you too. Um, so you had a really year of your approvals if you, you approve the I'm concept. I'm thinking of to what date in the fall might we want such a structure to remain permitted. We can move forward and, and try to oh, work something you. out. Mm -hmm. um, Tyler, is there a desired time frame in terms of seasonality? Uh, when people, uh, <laughs> Two months ago. Uh, we, we said yeah. the <laughs> Uh, it's sunny out. People want to sit. End of um, my, at least in our I'm, I'm ready to go as quick as as can be. To I'm thinking of to what date in the fall might you want such a structure to remain permitted. October 5th. Oh, gotcha. Um, <laughs> I can't really <laughs> speak to when people. Uh, 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 we, we seem uh, tend to see a seasonal uh, downshift uh, yeah. uh, towards the end of October. Well, say, At least in our Richmond location, people a tend to sure choose to stop sitting outside. And what exactly? What do you when do you think it needs to be done? That's absurd. When would it open? May May fifteenth, October fourteenth. Spring time, yeah, May 15th would work. Yeah. Well, I'll also say, I personally would propose we do this as a one year pilot and make sure it's working for everyone. Uh, just in terms of saying, we're trying it out for a year, it's not something that's been done in Waterbury that I know of. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just to sit and we can do it. Approve the two parking spaces um, pending getting all of the appropriate reviews for this year through the 15th and then revisit next year. Second. Unofficially? Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 I a motion in there, but yeah. 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 you want to accept it as a motion? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just to sit main, like, uh, we can do it as a motion. I guess I'll make the motion. So I would move to approve the use of two parking spaces on Stowe Street for outdoor seating for Stone's Throw, um, subject to additional review. Yeah. of a structure we're by we're public we're works yeah. and zoning. Okay, well, if we're not going to do it this year, then I would rather have a formal. We have to like, say that I mean, like, yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, it's not going to do it through this year. October 15, 2024. Um, yeah, as of one year. I mean, 2024. Uh, no, 2024 of this year, one year pilot this season. Season five. Can it get done this year? I don't know if we're going to get the idea of approval then. Yeah. Okay, if we're not going to do it this year, then I would rather have to approve it first. I mean, I guess I'm happy to say, like, yeah, I'm fine with it if he's not going to do it this year. I don't. Yeah, I think getting it through the DRB. Visibility is visibility to me. It's going to be at the early, mid August, you know, and late August. So I don't know how feasible it's going to be for this year. Happy to bring my tools and start making something. Tyler, what do you think? Would you like us to try to approve it for sure, this year and try to get yeah, something sure. started? Yes, please. I understand, <laughs> but I've been coming to meetings for a long time. Visibility is visibility to me. I, I, I would appreciate anything the out there. Um, now talking about taking away and if it comes so down to it, I'm think um, about that. happy to bring I my tools and, and start I'm making totally something. Understand. People like to get outside. But then, okay. how much? Jerry's got his hand up. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to get when people start saying, "I'm making way more parking spaces"? But I've been coming to meetings so, for a long time, so and the biggest one of the biggest issues in this community for a long time is lack of parking. And now you're talking about taking away more parking spaces. So I would just encourage you to think about that. I get why it's going. I totally understand. Would like to be outside. Determine but the then, still, how much uh, even with the loss of backlash are you going to get when people still, start saying, uh, now you're taking away more parking available space? Available parking space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. well, and I think that was part of the discussion already. Oh, right. uh, the Casey Bagel uh, owner already has some church concern. Church? As I understand it, uh, the recent study that uh, Public Works did uh, really determined that there was still uh, even again, with a loss of 51 South Main that there was still uh, available parking space. And then we are the so economy of scale and the environment is workable otherwise. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Was the church or the congregation? Any further discussion? Was the church. Was the church. Uh, just okay. to be clear, I had a motion. And I just say that's why I said it's a one year thing, because if it's really not working, I would not be inclined to do it again. But I think it's worth 
giving folks the benefit of the doubt. I'm also just assuming or stating for the record that we really need two spots to make the yeah. economy of scale and viability workable. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further discussion? I think it has to start here. I think you have to. Approve. Just to be clear, I had a motion with no second. Right. Yeah, Mike. Second. Sort of second in the motion. Yeah. Yeah. And my only, I made the motion behind the question is DOP. Just recognizing they're in state law and it's the Any further discussion on the motion? Notice period and adjoining property owners. And maybe we think that's right. I think it has to start here. 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 <laughs> okay. Any further discussion on the motion? No, no, no. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. I will say your aye. 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 the Congo Church is working out fabulous. Any opposed? Up there, mm -hmm. Any abstentions? Good. All right. The motion to uh, use the two parking spaces for a uh, really project uh, through the 15th of October is approved. Right. Uh, the update temporary sign bylaw at the welcome sign. Thanks, right. Thanks, 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 Thank you, Charles, for drafting. There's a place that uh, people can put political signs uh, within 14 days of the election. Something we discussed, I believe, so, at the last just meeting. To, be clear, um, bylaws to, to give approve the select board use of that area adjacent to the uh, roundabout uh, and uh, the abutting the uh, railroad trestle. Uh, as so a place that uh, people can put political signs uh, within 14 days of the election. So if that ever wanted to be changed, you would have to ask plenty so of So just to be clear, the zoning bylaws to on that. give the select board the authority the interpretation is to allow for signs in the right of 14 days before You don't have the authority to change the 14 day rule. 14 days, yeah, uh, prior to the actual So if you wanted to the 14 day rule is part of the zoning. Mm -hmm. So if that ever wanted to be changed, you would have to ask planning commission probably as a carryover to weigh in on that. Um, okay. But and it the interpretation is that that means um, that uh, it's 14 days before to the, the day of last day of voting. Uh, 14 days, yeah, prior to the actual election day. Otherwise, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, maybe the maybe the 14 day rule is from years ago before there was early voting i'm not sure mm -hmm. it probably is a carryover um but it wouldn't make sense to any discussion um, on this? to have a 45 days prior to the actual election day and then have a 14 day which you could put a piece line 45 days before then it's going to be down in two weeks mm -hmm. do we consider that i stole ian's language right of way valuable and highly visible, visible public space Thank you, Ian. Uh, any discussion on this? <laughs> um, I guess a no. No, uh, it's the only one, but uh, it is a one uh, that people have. Uh, Do we consider this to be the only public right of way where this would be permissible? Overview of the whole sign rules mm -hmm. and so forth. From, from talking to Woody. Um, it doesn't die. favor <laughs> roundabout itself just because of the visibility issues. I don't know if it's the, the only one, but uh, it is a one uh, that people have uh, expressed interest in. Uh, so at the start, a complete uh, overview of the whole the sign rules. Outside of the right of way from, to I'm talking to Woody. Um, he doesn't favor allowing size in roundabout itself. Just because of the visibility issues and traffic, right? When you're dealing with the rest of our right of way, predominantly you're talking edges of roads which get beat up an awful lot. Technically, 14. Um, so it's probably not a good idea to do it there. Mm -hmm. 
It's yeah, political side. It's our political side. They're showing up Outside of the public way, it's usually private property, and uh, people are allowed to do that for 14 days. They don't care who uh, Based on the owner's uh, permission, right? Do I I guess you ain't looking at the soil. You can put a sign in your yard if you want. Resolution <laughs> regarding <laughs> <laughs> technically <laughs> 14 days. Yeah, 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 Aye. 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 I move that the select board adopt this right. resolution regarding Proposed political signs at the roundabout on the signs as written. And, and make the quote I will line. second that motion. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. Just second. All those say aye. 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 We're all still here for the real resolution. Well, we need to do two of you to sign this. This proposed select board resolution is approved. Yeah, we have something and we have Tom print one that doesn't say proposed and just say make the quote the other one. Okay. Okay. I will not sign. I will not sign the proposed uh, Next one. resolution. Next one. The real one. You need to do two of you to sign this schema. Which I need to note. So, come on, let's do that. And we'll do some signing. Can we count? That's my point. Fix it for the applicant and just say chair. I was going to text you, but I knew you didn't have your phone. Yeah, I'll text you. And prior to the time of election, I'll just give you one. Please do. I just unlocked the computer. That would be just something like Mullen. Oh, Kevin McCallum? McCallum, I'm sorry. I was going to text you, but I knew you didn't have your phone. Yeah. MC Capital Okay. And you need Mike to sign to? Yeah. That would be great. And then we'll start I just realized I didn't have your phone. So oh, really? I to text you. Yeah. I know. He's with seven days. Yes. Yeah. 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 I read that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Mm -hmm. He lives with seven days. Yeah. Yeah. He has goats. MC. Capitals. So, Roger has signed it. Oh, he's emailed me. Is it two witnesses? Sorry, you don't think so. He's with seven days. Yeah, I wrote that. It's the only place to sign. Well, it sounds like we're up. He doesn't want Just that one. Yeah, I've now did it for his name. He has goats. So, Roger has signed it, Mike has signed it. I think the only other question is Gallagher. Is it two witnesses? Yeah, it's a face for two witnesses. Oh, okay, two witnesses, and then I need to know the right. That's the only place to sign. Well, it sounds like we're all. Is that one spot? Should I let Ms. Penner go find? Oh, yeah, you can both do witness if you want to. Yeah, right. Right. I asked Mr. Concerns. Gallagher to date it today Signage. for me. He signed it. Put in a pin. And he was in that and swapped it. Oh, I guess it's a fact. Word. Mm -hmm. Just the one? Or is it mm -hmm. No, just that one. When Tom comes back, we'll take up noise concerns um, for discussion. Mike, do you know is that it's terrible Wi-Fi and uh, service here at yeah. Lake Buck Buckley? End of the meeting. Yeah, it's not, uh, I would imagine it's not that good. <laughs> I've got a two-meter radius that I can stand in. <laughs> Just being connected. Mm -hmm. That sounds about uh, right. You probably have to so stand I'm up. Battling and um, and whatnot, but I'm still Mike, you do you know this, yeah. that there's terrible <laughs> Wi Fi and uh, <laughs> service here at Lake Buck, Buck Lake? Yeah, it's not, uh, I would imagine it's not that good. But I will say, I've got a this, um, two meter radius. They don't, they don't worry, about it's, they don't want the kids to be online when they're uh, uh, conservation. So I'm, I'm battling flies and whatnot, but I'm talking to you guys. 
conversations about what it is you know Sometimes through the Lake River uh, with this course this week this is really interesting uh, just in terms of what we're yeah, going through Bill but I will Buck. say this um this they don't, course, they don't want the kids they don't want the kids to be online when they're up up at conservation <laughs> true um a lot of right. interesting conversations up, about uh, noise the noise you discussion. know through lakes and rivers uh with this course this week which is really course. interesting uh just in terms of what we've been going maybe through maybe we should start with state ordinance um, cool. <coughs> yeah well men i haven't gotten there okay we haven't we, are, we, are, we haven't gotten the state ordinance uh <laughs> ian you came up with some really? signage uh, that you texted me. all right let's um, take up where was that and what did you Third find third discussion out? signage uh state this was just in burlington uh that i was um, looking at but they do it, have maybe we should yeah, start with state ordinance on the lake <laughs> In Burlington, yeah, um, okay. We haven't, with, yeah, we, you know, we haven't they just gotten the same ordinance. They, they uh, don't go in depth Ian, you enough came up to with give depth to levels, uh, that you uh, but they're being signed with time. Where was that? Uh, where did you find kind of that? around the lake in certain communities. Uh, this in was just and I thought, you know, in Burlington, just given our conversations uh, that I was looking at, but they do have, yeah, signage along and that was specifically in Burlington. With you know, uh, they just give times. No, they they don't go as just in a, depth a enough to give decibel levels. Between the hours, um, mm -hmm. but there is signage with right, times, uh, uh, kind of around the lake in certain communities yeah. in Burlington. Um, and I thought, you know, just well, given our conversations, right, it was an interesting really example of what other communities are doing. Oh, and that was specifically air break. Uh, no, that was simply noise ordinance, just a, a general noise ordinance between the hours, uh, like eight, or I'm sorry, ten and seven, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but nothing about Jake breaks or anything specific, really. We're not allowed to use that term any longer. Oh, sorry, my apologies. My apologies. Looking at it quick, Vermont does have a general noise ordinance. That's full level, not specified, but it's a 50 dollar fine. Um, between sunrise and sunset, can't fire guns, blow horns, and other unnecessary offensive words. Can you say the term? A sunrise and sunset. Yes, sunset and sunrise. So, specifically, have a little backwards. It goes to work, but it says, uh, like a very old rule. Yeah. Sections should not prevent a person employing workmen from bringing bells or using whistles or gongs, blah, 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 and at such Gons. hours as the selectmen of the town, the aldermen of the city, or the trustees of the village may prescribe in writing. So, yeah, that's what you have to do. Yeah. 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 Probably reasonably close. Shall we allow the use of gongs after dark? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my gong out. There's a fairly loud uh, set of bells that go off uh, from the Methodist Church, which uh, during the winter is well after uh, sunset. There are decibel levels for vehicles, and I believe that's 82 decibels at 50 feet in a normal operating environment, however that is defined. Um, Try chasing down an offending. Yeah, I was going to say, like, fart cans on Subarus. Try catching up with those guys. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that this is already in state <coughs> statute, uh, so ostensibly the uh, Vermont State Police are uh, ready and able to uh, issue enforce. That's correct. Um, what I, what I, I guess I have felt for years, having dealt with this issue, just just living here, is that um, the state, I think, should consider regulating things like muffler modifications. Mm -hmm. um, in my judgment, you. Maybe there's an argument for motorcycles, which need to be loud, so that because they're not seen as well. But I think in general, um, I personally fail to see the need to have a modified muffler for the average human being. Um, but I think it's a state regulation mm -hmm. that they should address. And they can they can do that, you know, by not allowing them to be sold in the state or not allowing 
on the modifications to whatever they want to do it. Uh, well, I think there's certain standards by when you inspect your car that if you do have certain <coughs> modified in the state of Vermont, it's straight piping you can't have. Right. When you straight pipe your exhaust. Right. But no, um, the large glass packs. I was going to say the large Folgers can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tailpipe are totally, totally legal. I'll just say the one who was really excited because I thought there was a state ordinance who would uh, save us, so to speak. Um, I don't know if gongs after dark is quite it. <laughs> and I guess the question would be clearly we can create a noise ordinance if we want to. I would say personally it is not the top of my list of concerns um, at this juncture. I think people are more concerned about loud parties after, you know, unreasonable. They hours. are. Well, some are. <laughs> that, that's what I think people are get so, most mad about. If, I, if we do create something, a strange caveat like gongs, so in 50 years when they're like, do we have something on the books? Then they look back. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, keep it there for posterity. Yeah. Uh, during my listening campaign a couple of weeks ago, uh, I did get a comment about uh, the use of air brakes coming down uh, the ramp from uh, I-89 into the traffic circle uh, from a resident on Butler Street. Uh, and uh, she said it was constant at any time of day or night. It's not the engine brakes, it's the air brakes? Is that, is that's that what we're now calling it. Yes, those, those brakes where they throw a switch and use the engine to... Uh, it's an exhaust brake. Exhaust. It's an exhaust brake, okay. All right, so now we have four names. Okay, exhaust brake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, in my mind. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just Absolutely, if you know about diesel at all. Do our fire yeah, trucks have are. those, Gary? Almost all of our fire trucks have those, and what it does Quite honestly, and ours are not as loud as like some of the tractor trailers. Right. But it allows you not to have to use your brakes all the way down a hill. Right. Because if you don't have that, you could literally run out of air. Uh -huh. <coughs> so if you're coming down, so say, say Blush yeah. Hill, yeah. you're going to be using your brakes a lot. The brakes are going to heat up. You're going to use a lot more air. And then you come down the ramp. So the exhaust brake allows you to use a little bit of back pressure to not have to use your brakes. Now, our fire trucks have very quiet exhaust brakes compared to big tractor trailers. Oh, and three, four, I would not be in favor of saying we can't use exhaust brakes coming down some of those hills. It just is dangerous, to say in my you. opinion, to mm -hmm. come down Blush Hill and then not have brakes at the bottom. Yeah, that would be dangerous. Yes. What about the signs still have that just say please? Because there's a tractor trailer truck on Route 100 every night that uses his brakes in the manner in which you're describing, which seems pretty unnecessary to me. Yeah. To be I, I, entering my little Route 100 sure. corridor right there with your. Yeah, and, and there's a difference. I'm, I'm, not, exhaust brake exhaust, I'm not concerned about coming down 100. Right. I'm just talking about some hills where you don't want to ride brakes. Right. That's all. Yeah. And we don't get many tractor trailer trucks on Blush Hill. No. One right. of the other big complaints, Gary, was from trucks coming through town and pumping those brakes, which begs the question as why are they going fast enough to require those brakes in the middle of town? Right. Well, why is everybody going fast enough to require brakes? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, a valid point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, if you're... Part of what I'm thinking is, if you say you can't use them, mm -hmm. who's going to enforce that? Mm -hmm. Because well, that I'm going to, t quite honestly, I would suggest to my drivers, if you're coming down Blush Hill, Perry Hill, some of these steep hills, I want you to use that because I don't want you to crash at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Does it have to be a town-wide thing or can it be on certain certain streets and neighborhoods <coughs> where, where using of those brakes would probably not be required in most situations? Agree. Yeah. yeah. Agree. It's a courtesy question, right? I don't it's a know courtesy if, question. If it's like people on Main Street, if they're running those brakes, I think they're just doing it to be. They're not as loud as some of those little right. teeny cars that are going around with the mm -hmm. exhaust pipes. Right, the, the little race <laughs> burner kind of things with the high pitch. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But I understand the rationale. I get it. Yeah. But there is a there is a real safety reason for them in some places. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to enforce. Right. But if it's a request, then it's not necessarily an enforcement issue. If we just put a sign saying, please, like downtown area, mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. Please try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. It would be so good. And but then are we still uh, would be putting up this sign ostensibly within the uh, V Trans right of way, uh, and then we would have to get there. Permission, I would think. Yes. Don't we, don't we do that? Okay. I just hope the guy in Middlesex was, uh, was V Trans. So if I we can order it. signs, that's easy enough. Um, do you want to be specific about where you want them, or you just want me to? I think we should be. Way in? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I've gotten one request for the ramp coming down on the uh, southbound lane of Route 100 uh, into the traffic circle, roundabout. Yeah. Uh, Karen has mentioned Waterbury Center, and uh, somebody else mentioned uh, Main Street. Main Street. Where, where, where are Waterbury Street? Street? Um, so right up over Bank Hill usually is, is where it's, where I've heard complaints and where I've heard it myself, uh -huh. is, is between the res and blackback. Right, uh, right, right, in that. In right, front right, of right in front of McGillicuddy's. Right in front of McGillicuddy's. Good. Okay. Now, that's a pretty high signing, signed <coughs> area already. Uh, um, maybe, uh, maybe maybe mount a sign before that. Okay, we'll figure that out. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a look at that. That if it was in Dak Row where the speed sign was, it just said. Do it right in front of town hall. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't use your both ends of the village. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Right. So I'm yeah, assuming it's only going one way, but that's the village. A really mm -hmm. um, I have concerns yeah. about the ramp, though, because that seems like an appropriate time to pump your air brakes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I get that. Uh, on the other hand. It does make a racket for that neighborhood. Um, it it's a safety uh, issue. Yeah. Maybe we don't have to use them the all the way down the ramp. I mean, I'm, if I'm speaking from my own experience, as truck this, this particular truck that travels every night comes south on Route 100. I think it is plate number, but he holds some kind of livestock. You can tell by the back of the truck, it has all that caged. Mm -hmm. and, um, every night. Um, every what night. What does he hold? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, down by like the was it in front of like, yeah, yeah. Cool. no right? So I'm at the I look at Seuss Drive, like that's what you look at out yeah, okay. front window Over is there. Seuss Drive. So it's as he comes from Greg Hill southbound, comes yeah. around that Chittenden Blue Heron Drive. And he hits and he holds that brake to yeah. slow down because the speed limit drops right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have to drop from 50 down to 35. 35. So that's where he does it. And I will state for the record Nancy Patterson, who lives way down by the Glassboy studio, approached me about this years ago. And I was like, oh, Nancy. <laughs> it's like, so she hears it down there, and he's hitting it back up by my house. So that's what, a mile away? So somewhere in that corridor, I guess, before you approach that 35 mile an hour speed zone. So That's still under 100. Okay. So, we'd have to be out, yeah, out past Cold Hollow towards Greg Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like near Blue Heron Drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between Greg Hill and Blue Heron Drive. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't, this particular driver does not use them headed northbound. It's only yeah. when he comes out. Sorry, so well, there's no reason to slow down by the northbound. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. I would assume he's hitting them like right by Howard Ave, too. Yeah, perhaps. He yeah. could be hitting them a second time. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Our motion to instruct the manager to find these delightful police signs and place them in that location? Yep. Sure. I'm not making it. Well, I'll, I'll, I will make the motion. I move to 
ask the town manager to find, please don't pump your air brake signs, and place them in the neighborhoods previously requested. Do I have a second? Second. Motion seconded. Any further discussion? I just thought I'd throw this out. Yeah. If one of you wants to find your inner child, I'll take you in a truck so you can take one of those hills so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Just in the fire truck? <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> I'll remember that. Yeah, we'll go to the quick 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 we all have to be in different, different trucks. Oh, <laughs> Just for the record, my kids had a tour of the yet. fire station Earlier. last week, and they didn't get that offer. They right. went like that. Yeah. So I'm just saying, they yeah, have just the, two, the two of us are we're not for what The difference is just freewheeling and having something holding the truck back. But they are yeah. just asking. It's a courtesy, right? Yeah. But they're not. Yeah. 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 I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But people aren't all that crazy. Use it when you need it as a safety measure. It's just it's common sense, but some people don't necessarily use common sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anybody say sure? Uh, uh, Mike second. Mike second. King made the motion. We have had some discussion. Any further discussion? No, hearing none. All of you say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? All right. So that directive is approved. All right, now we have a uh, next meeting agenda. The next meeting will be the 29th. Uh, we've already suggested that it will be focused on the flood and mm -hmm. after action discussion thereof. There's two here, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you expect the after action discussion throughout that um, hour and 30 minute threshold? I was wondering. I think I suggested it for the record, so if it needs to get mm -hmm. bumped again, that's fine with me. I like the idea of a flood concept, hazard mitigation, but then we could do an after action after that, maybe. And like the FEMA buyouts and the more logistical stuff. Yeah. Um, Liz is in the back talking. I guess I would just say, like, for work, we do community conversations and we start with a list of. Or, anyway, in our case, it's a three month process. Month one, it's all brainstorming. Month two, we come back with like 20 ideas and people dot vote on what they like most. And the third is action planning, which isn't relevant here. Um, I mean, do we want to do like an abbreviated format of that where the first X amount of time would be reviewing the laundry list as we did tonight, asking for additional input to the laundry list? Mm -hmm. I mean, depending on format, we literally can like put them on paper in the room. You can do an equivalent online with either a Google form where folks vote for top ones. We use a platform called Poll Unit if you need it live in real time, but I assume we'd want it open yeah. after. But just to say, we could do a structure like that. Can yeah, I, Gary. I think that'd be fun and useful. Liz, I'm putting on the vote. spot. You talked about crew facilitating at the next meeting. I just described like the quasi VCRE process of having a list of ideas, ask for additional ideas, and then a dot vote. Does that seem along the lines of what crew was thinking? Yeah, I think it's just the thing we discussed, right? You and I, Tom, and it was just this was really like a two topic meeting, and that's all. Yeah. Right? So, and at the fire station, right? Was Mm -hmm. um, right, make it big, give people the chance to come and talk about their ideas, but don't do all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Why did we choose to do it at the fire station? So people More would come people. and walk around the room and put things on post notes. But you can do it wherever you want. Happy. Oh. Well, Just we may fire have fire stuff available. in here still. It depends on the shop back. Fire station's yeah. available. Okay, why don't we go to the fire station, see if we can get a crowd. And uh, do... Dot vote. Uh, we can open up the meeting and then uh, ask a crew to facilitate that uh, if uh, Liz and company are so disposed. We don't need all that on so the agenda. I was just saying for conversation. Yeah, we are moving the 29th meeting, the 29th meeting to the fire station. Is that right? That's it. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a proposal. Mm -hmm. They'll definitely give us a lot more room to, uh, yeah. for people to circulate. 
don't have to worry about what's what's going on in here. I think it's good that we have it at the fire station because it's saying we are we encourage people on what their ideas are too. Mm -hmm. you know, because like here is kind of a confined space, and they may be more willing in a bigger space to to park this. Yep. Okay. Time is still seven, though. Is that correct? I think so. Seven o'clock is fine. Mm -hmm. Unless it feels like the time needs to be different. I don't think it's going to take. Uh, how long do you expect that process to take? Uh, I mean, in the spirit of this, we could allow an hour, hour and a half. I mean, it's mostly how much discussion. That's the yeah. like. Like I said, when we do, we do three three-hour meetings, but we're doing, you know, a full everything you want to talk about in the community, mm -hmm. not one topic. Mm -hmm. I would say, like thinking offhand, I don't know what crew would do. The hardest part is kind of like the consolidating of ideas, you know. So like, <laughs> I wrote in my notes for tonight, uh, Randall Street Mega Berm. <laughs> so does yeah. Randall Street Mega Berm get a piece of paper? But all of those. Um, uh -huh. New ideas, just we would need to, in real time, be adding those to the voting list, which I think is totally doable. Yes. Um, yeah, it would take at least half an hour to get all those ideas out. Yeah, I was, I was at half an hour, and 45 then minutes. Probably yeah, another half hour for people to. Uh, so I think, I mean, we plan an hour and a half, and then have the half hour at the end be the. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. and mm -hmm. after action can be cool. Yeah. 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 And then let's. Uh, Set the agenda for um, August 5th as well tonight, and we'll have to spend as much time on it. Uh, sure. Can I sure. can I just review what I think I'm hearing? No. So at 7:15, we're doing flood concept hazard mitigation for one and a half hours. Yeah. Okay, and then FEMA buyouts and after action. Okay. That's the 29th at the fire station. That's that. And at, at, on the 29th, we can we can move something from the parking lot. Um, it doesn't need to be an agenda item, but I can present an intro text my gut. Because I'll be ready by then to be um, a good chance to text my gut. Okay, so we're taking up executive session and we're not going to do that that night. Yeah, we're going to have a meeting the very next Monday. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I have a plea then. Mm -hmm. um, I will be there, and I will be. I will do minutes, or I will do Zoom. But I need somebody willing to help me manage those two platforms because yeah. there, if there, there's the potential for a lot of participation on Zoom, and I can't mm -hmm. do Zoom and be constantly on my minutes at the same time. I found that hugely challenging when we were at the fire station for yeah. the I'm armory not, talk. If we're gonna do sort of a charrette and voting and people may introduce new concepts and also make sure Bob is around and helpful. Yeah. And we also I mean I'm happy to do it, but yeah, when we set we set with like four people for in my high meeting. Like yeah, I essentially need one on more than tech logistics. support, I need like finger support. Finger support. I need somebody yeah. who's willing to take the, uh, the zoom over the zoom. if that's Alyssa or if that's Tom or whoever it is. Yeah. But to manage those Maybe to crew members. And yeah, and we'll that's fine. We don't have to decide yeah. tonight, but I'm just saying I, I, I know my limitations. I can't do that. I can't do Zoom at a big. Yeah. And I also reduced it back down, so am I putting it back up? Oh, what are we, what does it cap at, 99? I think that's plenty. I, I think it caps at 100, and I had to go up for the armor stuff. Yeah. So it probably caps yeah. at 100. Can you do it just for the month, or does it have to be? No, you can do it for a month, and then cancel it. I think 100 is workable. I just got to know now, because I haven't yeah, I can't imagine more than I can't see more than that. OK, if you hear, start hearing word on the street that a lot of people are going to attend, let me know. Okay. And I can up it well, the we, day before. We could almost advertise that we only have. No, no, no. I don't want to limit yeah. participation. Okay, but I'd rather encourage people the, to come. Come in person. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. Just just getting all this out there now while it's yeah. on my mind. Yeah. Right. You don't want to limit participation. Because I can't up it in the middle of the meeting. <laughs> <the line. laughs> it's just easier with people there to manage. Okay. All right. And that's it for that meeting agenda. I think so. Okay. All right. All right. Moving on to um, August 5th. This comes off, doesn't it? Woot woot. Yeah, concerns. It's done. 
Uh, leaf paper traffic. Uh, oh, I was also informed <coughs> by um, the Disa Natural Disaster Committee that they are going to have some sort of manual ready by the end of this month. So that might be a good time to introduce huh. us to such manual. Not not the day when we're doing all the flood stuff, but a day when we're not doing all oh, the flood fifth. stuff. Yeah, the fifth. You want the fifth? I will reach out to Matt and make sure that that's ready by that time and see okay. if I can get him and John to come present it. Roger, did you have time to reach out to Karen Nevin about the leaf keeper? I talked to Dan Schneider today. Uh huh. Um, I did not. Uh, did think about it, but okay. uh, as far as far as I got, um, I was wondering if uh, uh, inviting I Owen would do background. the trip, just because <laughs> Owen is potentially more available than uh, than Karen, um, and he is our economic development guy. Sure. Um, and I'm meeting Karen Wednesday at ten, so I can. Uh, All right. Can you just ask her if, the, sure, if so. either she or Owen can be available mm -hmm. yeah. on the fifth to address uh, leaf paper traffic? Uh, because uh, I don't know what Karen heard today, but when I talked with Dan, he felt like this needed to be a larger conversation because the RW is actively promoting business. Uh, his business. It depends on heavy people traffic. A bunch of ideas. As do a number of businesses around here. Uh, it just feels like it needs to be, that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, so it's not just a problem, but it's uh, a phenomenon yes. that uh, actually su supports the town. So. We didn't get that much into the weeds today, but mm -hmm. I didn't get the impression his opinion has changed either way. Right? He yeah. still wanted RW's involvement. I don't think he cares whether it's Karen or Owen, but just, okay. just that support. All right, if we could just bring that up. Um, other items for uh, the fifth? Question around? Um, yes, Ian. I was going to throw a, a vote in for. Um, downtown driving and pedestrian safety. Uh, that's when we talked about uh, a number of weeks back that I don't think will be a super lengthy item, I'm hoping. Um, but I'm also not committed to that. I'm just going to throw a vote in for it. We think it can, uh, can wait till subsequent meetings. I'm happy to uh, oblige to that as well. Okay. Uh, based on what I've seen so far, we could certainly bring that back up. Um, it was something that we discussed briefly uh, about a month ago. Yeah, and again, we are we, we didn't give up. We are working towards the the flesh and crosswalks. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent, great. Um, and so if we think we're ready for it. Great. If not, then that's great too. Would you be ready for it? Um, the For just the conversation, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anything we want to look into the parking lot and see if it needs to be pulled up? How are we doing on parade and event permits? I was going to propose something different, which was local option tax, but I don't know if that's not appropriate at this point. <laughs> don't we already have one of those? We do. And we said we would adopt a final policy on it, and then when I went to get a copy of the final policy, I don't see in our minutes where we finalized it. Okay, we can do that. Um, but I don't want to, if that's going to be can of forms, that doesn't need to be an August 5th problem. Um, in part with the whole housing trust fund discussion, to the extent they're improved related, or mm -hmm. we'll that as just a separate agenda item and do both. Roger, when you mentioned um, yeah. parade and event, uh, did, have we heard anything even anecdotally about this? We had NQID and the craft fair at the same <coughs> time. Were there any pedestrian kind of issues that wound up coming well, up? Well, I've heard plenty of anecdotes from a single, a singular source. <laughs> uh, other than there was a lot of rain and stuff like that. But, Let it rain the first day. Um, right. I haven't heard. And I know they, they supposedly they didn't have a, you know, the parade also had 
and NQID, the whole festival had turnout problems. I'm sure, I know they did. My wife <coughs> went to the craft fair and she said almost no one was there. But Sunday, I think they had a little I, better turnout. I thought it was fine. I thought it was a typical craft fair. You know, they never quite have a million people. What I, I did suggest, I don't know if I ever relayed this message formally or if, or if Katarina did, but both parties want to reserve the field for the same weekend next year. Right. And, and I suggest, and I said no. Plenty of time to figure that out, but maybe we need some form of. And we've never had we've never had competing interests. Exactly. For the that, field. That's what, another place I was going to go because I know there are two different. <laughs> There's room for both. I don't think they want to share. Yeah, I think they would want each wanted and I'm their own. Reluctant to suggest the select board needs a policy for something that's happened once in our history. Right. Um, so I think we can work that out internally. How soon can either one of them apply for next year? I mean, the system opens 364 days. Yeah. So the next day. So they can. One of them already has. Oh, they have applied already? Well, they both expressed to us way in advance that they right. basically want it in perpetuity. In perpetuity? Yeah. Mm. Well, do we do in perpetuity? <laughs> I would highly suggest a <laughs> policy. I suppose, if, I suppose if you want to pay up front, and the oh, rate yes. is right, that might be considered. <laughs> Right. <laughs> huh. Okay, well, <laughs> you'd rather take this on yourself than uh, throw I, it to the select board? If we can't solve it, I'll bring it to you. But I okay, feel like all right. let's, let's see what you come up with. That's a way to solve it. <laughs> it's all solved. Uh, really don't have, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that I have great confidence in my ability to solve it. I'm just suggesting I'm trying. <laughs> both, sit both parties down together. Right. And then toss a coin in the air. <laughs> 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 Have an anger manager <laughs> throw one permit on the table. <laughs> Who gets it? <laughs> Steel cage match down here. Okay. Um, anything else people want to talk about on the 5th? Uh, we will have time to uh, add more agenda items. But, uh, what was the last time? Looking a little late. When was the last time we had state police? Oh, that was supposed to be tonight, and we moved yeah. it in light of everything. Mm -hmm. I can reach out to the. Yeah, that, that might work, but I would like to we'll hear from stats them. Stats and evaluations? Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. Well, this would be a guess. I Just to say, Mike, we had looked on this template agenda, I think, going into this. Um, we also had the data stats, which right. also, for the record, Karen's been posting on the website. They're there. Um, but us discussing those, which could be part of that. <coughs> yeah, it's on this agenda just to make it onto this one. Uh, okay. I know, it, it, it's a little hard. I have many okay. templates for weeks in advance, so sometimes oh, yeah. those little things we get. It's great. I'll say this has been a great innovation in my time on the board. The, the collective future agenda brainstorming. Oh, yeah. I'll say, as a board member, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Are we to be expecting an executive session tonight? No. No. Ooh, okay. Is that going to be on every, every agenda? I think, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Just keep it on there. Just keep it on there. Um, there was some discussion about uh, uh, making, uh, doing more like one-stop shopping and clarifying what uh, permits you need to, yeah. and if you're going to throw an event, whether it triggers the need for an event permit, uh, other permits and so forth. Is that something to be discussed then, or it's something we want to work on, especially with the new zoning software we're putting in place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, that's so we work on it first, and then bring it forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's part of Mike's work that he's been doing. Like so. All right. All right. We'll leave. We'll, we'll keep that in the uh, parking lot until Mike's ready. All right. Any other business before the select board? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved.
Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We are adjourned. Sound tired.